last week on the Alan Nicoletti Show. Let's welcome him to the show, Bob Bloom. Bob, you're the man. What's happening? It's not just having the tools, it's how you use them that will make all the difference in the world. I didn't go into law to hurt people. I went into law to help people. You don't want to be the big target. You want to look like you're broke. So we want you to be rich, but look broke when a plaintiff's lawyer starts looking closely at you. The reason we use a limited liability company is to give you limited liability as opposed to unlimited personal liability. You know, Bob, great stuff. I mean, this is this is huge to bring up. New types of LLCs are being created all the time. There are 24 different types of LLCs. And by the way, the most recent one, the newest one was just created in July of 2021 in Wyoming. And it's specifically designed for crypto. You don't want to do your own surgery. You want to have a surgeon right. do it, right? We integrate these limited liability companies, not only to give you anonymity, but also to give you the liability protection. That breaks it down between why some people want to do it and some people don't. Document, document, document everything. The new law was passed this year, uh, authorizing 87,000 new IRS agents. If you've never been audited, plan on getting audited. Did you notice that as soon as he mentioned about the IRS agents, the viewers just jumped up? That was crazy. Great words of advice. Bob, thank you again for taking the time out of your night to be on here. Thanks, Al. What's up, everybody? Welcome to another Wednesday night live on the Al Nicoletti Show. So happy everybody's going to be tuning in for this special episode. I have an amazing guest, another one in the house. It's going to be an awesome time. For more content like tonight's episode, make sure you check out the Al Nicoletti YouTube channel, the Facebook page, the personal page, and of course, all the micro content that's constantly dropping on Instagram. It's at Attorney Nicoletti. We got things on quiet titles, probates, you name it, all the great stuff out there that you're trying to get over in the t messy, messy title game. You don't want to miss all that stuff. And you can catch all the episodes from season one, season two, season three on the Al Nicoletti show on iTunes, Spotify, and Google Play. You can find all of that over there. I can't wait to take notes on so much stuff in the real estate world, on dispositions, on closings, novations, the market, where things are at today with my man, David Olds. We are going to set a pace when it comes to this stuff. When David David and I get going on things, we just bounce around. We were talking about that pre, uh, stay on backstage about we can go from so many different topics. So you don't want to miss this. Make sure you get out your pen, your paper, uh, your notebook. I'm always taking notes when it comes to this stuff. So make sure you do all that and you don't want to miss this. So let's rock this thing. Hey everybody, my name is Al Nicoletti. I'm an attorney here in Florida and welcome to the Al Nicoletti show where I bring on real estate super investors, rising rock stars, movers and shakers, and leaders of clubs in their community that educate, entertain, and inspire all things on Florida real estate and different markets around the country. We're not just talking about Florida. We're not just talking about Texas, but we're talking about places in California, Colorado, Tennessee, where my man David Olds is from. We're talking where all these places that people are bringing such knowledge and information that can really help level up your business, no matter if it's Airbnbs, dispositions, title closings, messy things in title, or commercial property. I mean, you've seen some of the guests we've had. So this, this is going to be another one that you want to make sure you tune in on, on how you can take your company to the next level. On my show today, I have my great friend, the great David Olds, on my podcast because this guy, I love him. When, when we met, it was crazy. You know, we see so many people out on, on the internet doing reels, doing different content. And it's so crazy when you finally get to meet those people in person at a conference. And I remember the first time I finally, we, you know, we're running the show. David's, David's commented on the show. We've gone back and forth on social media. Uh, but the first time I get to meet him is at Tim Mai's Hero event. And it was crazy. I see, I see him 
when we're having breakfast, I'm like, wait a second, there he is, there's David. Uh, you know, finally we get to connect and it's so cool because you get to learn a lot about what people are working on, where they're at in their business, what they're doing. And David's a wealth of knowledge on the disposition side of real estate, in the title closings, getting into some crazy things, not just in one market, but nationwide, dealing with so many people that are all over the country. So you can learn something that David's done and what he's working on that can help level up your business. And we have him in the studio tonight in person, which is so different, right? We always have a different guest that'll do virtual. We'll have uh, people that'll come here in person, but it's so special that I get to have David come in person and I'm calling it the Thanksgiving day special because I'm so happy to have him as a friend. I'm thankful that he can be here. He can come in person. It's so special. So let's welcome him to the show without further ado. Wow. David Olds, David, my man. Dude, love I, am, it. I am so happy to be here. I'm so excited. But I don't know about that introduction, man. I don't know. I don't know who is going to come here and talk about all of those things. But uh, but thank you. That was I was incredibly kind and generous of you. Um, no, man, I'm, I'm super excited to be here and to be live on the air. And because I, I watch your show all the time, right? Like we're friends, but like also the, the content that you're bringing to people is just just amazing. And, you know, Yes, I love to comment on the show because I'm like a, a fan guy, right? You, you're you bringing on all these cool people that we do get to see at some conferences and, and just the information that they share is just incredible. So no, for real, I'm, I'm super honored to be here. Yeah, no, I, like I told you at the beginning, I mean, get ready for the explosion <laughs> because I mean, this is this is what it's like being on the show. Yeah. It's, like, it's no different than being virtual, right? Some yeah. people are like, whoa, I think this is crazy. Uh, David, so much that we get to unpack, we get to go through yeah. um, and, and we're definitely going to get to a lot of things in messages situations yeah. tenants uh covid what that mm -hmm. was all like mm -hmm. how you pivoted in yeah. your business because that that's something that a lot of people want to hear about mm -hmm. uh growth and partnerships that's something that growth and failure right and right like when things go terrible right it's yeah. not always about the successes but what no. happens when you have to overcome those right. failures and what's the next step there yeah. and uh so much more especially you know we're gonna we have to get into your social media game. I mean, you're, you're blowing it up on social media. You're always yeah. on Instagram. I'm, I'm always pulling up the feeds. <laughs> it's David old, David old, David old. And yeah. you're, but you're dropping purposeful content that yeah. means something to people. Well, out there. I'm not much of a dancer, you know, so th th there's going to be no, no dancing and no skits, right? I don't, that's not, I'm uh, certainly not good at that. So we're just going to talk about some real estate stuff. So. You got it. No, let's do it. So uh, as I do with all my guests, yeah. and I think it's so important that we have, an idea of your background, mm -hmm. like where did, where it all started. Yeah, and, mm -hmm. and this ends up being a loaded question I mm -hmm. ask, right? You know, where did you begin? How did it all start? Where are you at today? But no, yeah, but, yeah. but really like, what's the journey? What's the story of David sure. Olds up until today? Well, so mine is probably a lot longer than most people because I'm old. Like I'm an old guy. I'm 51 years old. So it's really funny when you become that old guy, like that's not how we did it in my day. Like, it's pretty depressing when you get to when that thought goes through your head. Um, but for me, so um, where to start? Let's see, married my wife in 2002, and we bought our first house. So it starts very simple like that. Um, I didn't think I could qualify for like, I didn't think any of the things that were going to happen. I'm like, nobody's going to give me a loan, right? Mm -hmm. Just mm -hmm. why would they? I'm a nitwit kid. And I'll try not to swear, but uh, you know, I'm this goofball. I got like a job and it's paying pretty good. And I was managing hardware stores actually here in Florida, Scotty's hardware stores, almost probably nobody is remembers them because they've been gone for about 15 years. But uh, yeah, so with my wife, we're buying our first house. And this was in the days when your realtor said, here is a packet, you know, of 40 houses, go drive by them and see what you like. Cause it was pre-internet mm -hmm. 2002. Like there was none of any of this existed, but anyways, so we find a house, we, we decide to buy it. And, uh, I go in, we buy it, we come back out. And I said to my realtor, I'm like, DJ, her name is DJ Rivera. Awesome. She's still a broker here in Florida. I said, I don't understand why I bought that from Wells Fargo. And she's like, well, dummy, it was a foreclosure. I'm like, I still like us. Is that, what does that mean? Right, right. Like, I don't understand what that means. Right. She's like, oh, well, you know, somebody had it. The bank took it back. I'm like, oh, okay. All right, well, whatever, right? Whatever. So um, I've got this house. And because I was in the business of working with contractors who were remodeling and doing things, 
And my day job, I actually ran one of the largest mill workshops in Central Florida. So a mill workshop makes the molding, they assemble doors and baseboards and like that kind of stuff, right? right. We, all the interior things. So, um, you know, I grew up, my dad was like, he was a military guy, but, you know, we fixed houses and stuff. So anyway, so we get into this house, I'm like, oh, well, I can upgrade this casing around the door to three and a quarter inch stuff because... I was in these million dollar houses. So I knew the things that were, that added value. So we spent, um, I guess we lived there for two years. We took out the carpet, put in laminate, nothing complicated, right? I replaced like five and a quarter inch baseboards around the house, you know, nice casing, a little bit of crown, <clears throat> changed out a sliding door for French doors, like nothing complicated. And a little over two years later, we wanted to move closer to where I was working. And um, we sold the house and made a really good profit. So again, now same realtor, we're going back into the closing mm -hmm. two years later. And she says, Hey, you know, DJ says to us, Hey, so you know, you don't have to pay taxes on this. Cause I was a little concerned. We we're making like 52,000. I'm like, Oh, that sucks. I'm gonna have to pay. I don't know what a third or whatever. She's like, no dummy. <laughs> no dummy. I'm like, what? She's like, Oh, it's homesteaded or you know, whatever it is. You lived in it for two years. So you don't have to pay taxes. It's like, Oh, really? Like that's a thing. Yeah, because I'm like 32. I'm like, I don't know, right? How, right. how, how would you know this? It's my first house. So I'm like, oh, okay. Well, cool. Like, so this is, that's that's good, right? 50 grand, right into Hip National Bank. So, okay. So we went and bought our next house. And this was in DeBerry, Florida. And this house, it was a beautiful subdivision. It was like Oak Run Court or something was actually the name of the street, but this really nice subdivision, all bri like beautiful brick Florida houses, like the oak trees, like really nice neighborhood. Not a place I should have been probably living, right? Because I'm right. a goofball. And uh, so we found this really ugly, the ugliest house in the neighborhood. I think it was like a divorce thing. And it just, the house just needed, it was just super dated, like pink tile, mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff. So it was kind of close to work. So I remember I went and looked at it with, with the same realtor. And uh, it was really weird. So like this woman lived there. And one thing I'll remember forever is I'm walking through the house. Nobody's there. And like, like bras and things are hanging. And I'm like, I was a little uncomfortable. But anyways, we bought this house. And I bought it for like 190 something. So the other house we bought for 97, sold for like 152, somewhere in there, right? So this one, I like, I was buying more house. So I was a little nervous, right? Because I was stepping up. And uh, I wanted to get it for like 170 and end up like 190 or something. And I remember my wife did not even walk through the house before we bought it. I walked it and I called her. I'm like, hey, uh, we just went through this house. It looks, I think we could buy this and fix it up. She's like, okay, buy it. I'm like, it's not really what I was looking for. I was looking for somebody to like pump the brakes a little bit. And my wife, God bless her, she's always like up for an adventure. Like, yeah, do whatever. Like, we're good. Want to invest 100 grand in oil? Yeah, we're good. Like, it's fine. But isn't that like a, a good spouse to have too, right? Well, One it's supportive, can... right? Right. So you want that. Like, and we could definitely talk about spouses and partnerships. And you want somebody that's on the same journey with you that's, that's yeah. in it for the long haul. Yeah. But we'll uh, include that in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, so my wife's like, oh, yeah, well, like, you can do it. We'll just, it'll be fine. We'll just buy it. Okay, yeah, you kind of want to check and balance, right? But right. but my wife Heather, she's she's awesome. So so we buy this house, same kind of thing. We fix it up. I mean, this one we did much more work to. We you know laid tile in the whole house, um, new kitchen, brought in like fourteen loads of dirt in the front to level out the yard, sod like it was a bigger rehab. And we sold that one for a little over three hundred thousand. So now we made a hundred thousand. Now I'm like. Well, we should figure this out. Maybe my dad was right. He always told me when I lived in Florida, I moved a lot for that company. I moved 11 times in nine years. And I do remember him saying, you know, dummy. No, um, I just have this thing of being called it. I don't know, dummy in my head. But he's like, you know, if you just quit renting these houses and just buy it, you could keep it as a rental. And my dad, he, I guess he had his real estate license when he was younger. So he had a little inkling of real estate, but he wasn't an investor. And I do think back to that. You know, there are always those things in your life that you'll you'll go back to and remember. And I'm like, boy, how smart was he? If I'd have bought 11 houses back in the 90s in Florida. Right. In Key Largo, oh, Homestead, yeah. Largo, Florida, um, you know, Boynton Beach and all those places where I lived. I'd have never had to do any of the things that I'm doing now. Right. But, you know, I didn't. So we sold that house. And then I remember I was at the airport picking up our kids. They were they were flying back and forth to Ohio on a company of miners. And 
I was killing some time because I don't know if anybody's ever, if you don't know because you don't have kids, but you know, kids can fly. You pay a little extra. The stewardess basically sits with them, but you have to be there mm-hmm. at the gate when they, when they come out. Right. Yeah. Otherwise they put them back on the flight and send them, send them home. And my wife was not going to have that. Like I wasn't making that call. <laughs> she wasn't going to be understanding about that at all. So anyway, so I'm there like an hour early. I'm at the bookstore and this is the most cliche thing. I'm standing in the book racks. I'm leaning on the thing and I'm just flipping through books and I'm reading this book and I'm like, oh, this is really good. I was like 10 or 15 pages into it. I'm like, okay, I got to go. Let me buy this book and I'll take it home. Rich dad, poor dad, right? The, the dumbest thing ever. It's so cliche. Nine out of 10 real, real estate investors start with this book. And I don't know why I picked up this book on that day, but I did. But so I go home and I read the book. And at the end, if I'm sure you've read it, Kiyosaki says, well, if you want to do oil and gas, do this. If you want to invest in stocks, do this. If you want to be in real estate, go find a, a local real estate group. Mm-hmm. So I've never been the smartest person, but I'm very good at following directions, right? I don't need to reinvent the wheel. Right. So I go to my computer. I want you to picture this. And it's like this big box monitor. Like now we're in probably like 2000 four or five, right? Like there's not even Google. There's definitely not Facebook. There's like web crawler. That's mm-hmm. what, that's what we got. So I'm like, you know, I mean, I lived in DeBerry at the time. I'm like Orlando or, you know, or central Florida, real whatever I right. looked up and I pulled up and I had done a little bit of research now trying to like, Oh, I need to do a, you know, figure, figure real estate out. So I remember this site came up and it was a wholesaler and I, I, I had researched enough to know that this was a wholesaler. And uh, his name his name was Todd Hutchinson. He's out of Central Florida, still a friend of mine. And uh, he had this resources page. So I click on the resources and it says um, Central Florida Real Estate Investors, CFRI.net. So I'm like, okay, let me click on that and see what it's all about. So uh, it says, uh, yeah, we have our meeting the first Wednesday of every month. I'm like, okay. I'm like, I'm going to go because the book says go. I'm going to go. We're going to do this. So I remember... This was July of maybe 2005, five or six, mm-hmm. in there someplace. Mm-hmm. I, but here's why I remember it's July. So I, so I tell my wife, you know, I, I leave work, not early, but like on time, and I'm going to drive down there. So I drive down to Orlando from Tiberi. It's, what, a 45-minute ride. So we get there, and it's at the Bumby Theater in downtown Orlando. And what it was was they just rented this big theater out to like hold their meetings. It's a, you know, this was sort of the heyday of Rio's way back then. So I pull in the parking lot and it's packed, packed. And there's all these cars with like decals and stickers and I buy houses, like a hundred of those, realtor, hard money, inspectigator, and you know, all these things. And I'm driving through looking for a parking place and I'm getting more and more anxious the longer this, like the more I'm looking for a parking place and I'm driving through the parking lot and I'm driving through and I'm out the fucking other side. And I drove home. Oh, you didn't even go? Couldn't go in. I was scared. Wow. So, yeah. so like, your first time trying to even go to one of these, you, you panicked. just panicked. Panicked, I'm like, I'm out. Can't do it. I don't belong here. I don't, there's, I, I don't, like, I don't belong here. Like, I, I these are real, these are real investors. And I can't be, I, I, I can't be here. Like, I just couldn't do it. I Freaking panic. Just overwhelming. Like, I just panicked. Yeah. Yeah. And little did I know at the time, CFRI was also the third biggest in the country, which is awesome because they, they put out so great of con, so much great content, but there were a lot of people there and literally I just panicked. So I went home and probably like I can count on one hand the number of times I have not told my wife the truth. She's like, how'd it go? I'm like, <sighs> couldn't find it. Couldn't find it. So now I do remember I didn't go the next month, but now I'm pissed. Like, have you ever like said, I'm going to, you tell yourself you're going to do something, then you don't do it. And mm-hmm. it just bothers you. It just eats at your core. Right. Mm-hmm. So, so now September comes around. I remember September because it was, it was like the day before my birthday or day after. And so now I'm like, F this, I'm going down. There. I don't care. I'm going down there and I'm going the fuck in. And I'm, so I'm like, you know, I'm driving down there like white knuckled, like, you know, just hyping myself up the whole time. Like I'm going in, you're doing this, you're doing this, you're going in, you're going to do this. So I go in there and I park and I'm like, you don't even, I don't even stop to think about it. And I go up to the, I go up to the window and I pay my 10 or $20, whatever it was. And I'm like, I'm going in. I get in. I'm like, I don't know what the fuck I'm doing here. What am I doing? And it's a very typical RIA set up there. Like all these tables with banners on them, you know, like we see all the time. And I'm like, I don't know what to do. So I see other people picking up a bag and going around and collecting pens and papers and erasers and flyers and, you know, all these types of things. So I'm like, I just do the same thing. Right. People are talking to me. I'm like, yeah, like, yeah. How you doing? Great. What you buying? 
oh, I just sold one in DeBerry. Like, I just kind of BSing a little bit, right? Injecting yourself in there a little bit. Yeah. Like the tiniest little bit. Yeah. But mostly I'm like, I want to keep moving. Yeah. So, you know, they're like, hey, we're about to start. So, so I go into the auditorium. And it's a big auditorium, a couple hundred people there. It's this is a big, a big Rio. And I, I'm like, I look around. I'm like, where can I sit where nobody's going to bother me? Oh, far back left hand corner. Okay. So I go back there. I sit down, take out my pad of paper, right? My pen. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to take notes. Like, this is school. I'm like, okay, I'm ready. So, so CFRI did this, re, does it, they probably still do it. Um, they do this really cool thing. They start with what's called deal of the month, right? Go figure. So, Right. Yes, right? Deal of the month. So so what they do is they would kind of pre-plan four, five, three, four, five people. They would come up, talk about a deal. Everybody would like, and the highest clap, they win you know, a $100 Home Depot card or something, right? right? Something like that. So, and this is the old days where it's on transparencies. I can never remember that. Like literally people have to prepare transparencies. It projects it up. Okay. So first guy gets up and he walks up like typical quintessential Florida guy. Like probably 75 years old, like 75 pounds. Literally, I do remember overalls and a white t-shirt. The only thing missing is the straw, right? And like old wrinkly Florida, guy. Man. Yeah, like like you know, been in the sun his whole life. And uh, so I'm sitting there, I'm like, okay, here we go. So he gets up there and he's like, Hello? And everybody's like, hello. He says, Hi, my name is Bob. And I don't know the guy's name. I wish I did, but I always just say Bob. Hi, my name is Bob. And I shit you not, the whole place goes, hey, Bob. And I'm like, <laughs> where the fuck am I? And he's like, so I was driving to North Carolina to see my kin folk. And I stopped in South Carolina. And I saw this house was for sale. So I stopped and talked to the guy. And he wanted, you know, sixty five thousand, and and I told him I couldn't pay him, but forty one thousand, so he couldn't take that. So I gave him my card, and like two weeks later, when I was driving home, he called me and said he would buy my house. I could buy his house. So I turned around and went back, and I bought the house, and hired a contractor. And we put, you know, and he's showing this up on the board. And I'm like, I'm writing everything down, right? I'm like, oh, I got to learn all this. And uh, he's like, yeah. So I sold the house and, you know, I made, you know, $49,000. I'm like, $49,000. I write it down. I'm like, huh. Wow. And everybody claps. I'm like, oh, that's great. Oh, one deal. Yeah, one deal in like 2005, right? right? I mean, it was a stunning number, whatever it was. I'm like, oh, wow. Okay. So, like, I'm still trying to process this. Bob gets down. The next person gets up. I do remember her name. Her name was Olga. Maybe the most beautiful, like, Russian girl that I've ever seen. So now I'm, like, leaning forward, taking my notes. And Olga gets up there, and she barely speaks English. And this girl starts talking about how, I won't try to do it with a Russian accent, but how she's flipping mobile homes all over Orlando for three, four, five grand a piece, like, five or six a month. That's crazy. So first dude talks with marbles in his mouth and slow. Second girl, you know, 23. I don't mm-hmm. know what, I don't even know, but I mean, she had all of my attention, but, um, and she's making, you know, 20 grand a month flipping mobile homes and doesn't look like she's ever worked a day in her life. I don't even remember what the next two people said. I don't, I have no, I, for real, I have no idea who the next two people were, but I'm sitting there in my chair going, holy shit. Old dude, 100 years old, talks with marbles in his mouth like this, Bob. And then Olga gets up there, and she doesn't even speak English. Mm -hmm. And they are making a ridiculous amount of money. Why am I not doing this? Right. And again, we talked earlier, like there are those things that just cement themselves in your brain. And I go back to that, that very moment all the time. I'm like, I understand you do not have to be smart in real estate. You don't have to be smart to make a lot of money. But you do have to do something to do it consistently over and over and over again. So that was my very first Rio. That's that's really crazy of a story because now you do you you hear what these people mm-hmm. are doing, right? And can you imagine what Olga's doing now? She's probably buying oh, a who knows? commercial property. I'm trying to find her on Facebook. Can't find her, right? Yeah, by now, right? Yeah, right. Uh, but you hear those stories and what was your next action step? So a lot of times mm-hmm. you'll get new people, yep. you know, and people that are watching, you know, some, some are new, some are seasoned. 
Mm -hmm. uh, you'll have different people that will show up at ARIA mm -hmm. maybe in January, first time. Mm -hmm. You know, They yeah. want to start the year. What was your first action step after you saw I that? I immediately got up, went back out, and signed up for my membership. Okay, so you signed up for your membership, and yep. then what did you do after that? Right. So the way CFRI is set up, again, it's a super well-organized RIA. So it's Central Florida, so it's all of the counties, Orange County, Volusia County. It's like all of those counties. So they have one meeting a month, but then there is literally a meeting four nights a week someplace. So there's the landlord meeting, the fix and flippers meeting, the wholesalers meeting, the tax meeting, the, you know, anyways, there's I, as many nights as I could, I was at a meeting someplace. Right. Because you have to learn about this. The thing about real estate is you can't go to university and learn it. They're not going to teach you. Yeah, know. they don't teach you anything. Right. And I get people that come into my office all the time like, yeah, I wanted to learn about real estate, so I was going to get my realtor's license. And I I try not to do that. <laughs> because, it's hard, right? it's so disrespectful. <laughs> but not that realtors are bad. I Well, I have a lot of great friends who are, are good realtors. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There are a lot of nitwit realtors, too. But there's also a bunch of terrible, shitty wholesalers. So, um, but people don't understand that RIAs exist and, you know, maybe your podcast or they don't know where to start. I... Got lucky for whatever reason. I picked up Kiyosaki. It told me what to do. But so, yeah, so a lot of people go to realtor school thinking that that's where they're going to get their education. So I started going to as many events as I could. You know, the, one of the great thing about Aria is they're always bringing in a, a speaker. Speaker, then they do a Saturday event for $97 mm -hmm. and you would go, I would go spend the day doing that. So like I learned about land trusts and just all the different things. So that's what's amazing. The bad thing about Aria is they present you with so many strategies and so much information. Um, I did see people that would start and jump from this to that, like a cat following a ball, right? Or following a laser pointer. And, you know, they never got started because they couldn't stick with one thing and just do it. Yeah. So this week it's storage units. Next week it's notes. Then it's lease options. And then it's, you know, this, that. Like Shiny every, object every yeah, time. Every right? month it's yeah. something. And we both know a lot of rich people. And they're not always, like, smart. Like, you don't have to be a, a rocket scientist to be smart. Pick a strategy that fits with your persona, that you kind of vibe with or whatever you want to want to say, that you enjoy doing, and go do it. Yeah, absolutely. I would never do probates. I also would not do short sales because that's I'm the talky guy. Like, I don't want to be doing paperwork. Yeah. You know, we were talking about paperwork earlier. I hate it. If you ever saw my desk, it's like, like you know, it's just, it's just trees were killed and there's just stuff everywhere. But the thing is, is though, that's why connecting with those people that yes. are specialists in mm -hmm. those industries, in those markets oh my goodness. really helps, right? Because then you're, you're saying, Hey, I know what we're doing in this market. I don't want to mm -hmm. do that, but I'll get mm -hmm. with somebody that knows how to do that. hundred percent. Right? So that's, that's also really big. Um, but David, you know, tell us, so like you were in Florida yeah. for a while. I was actually surprised because I didn't know the story yeah. until uh, I think we were, we were in San Antonio. Mm -hmm. But you were in Florida, yeah. and then all of a sudden you moved to yeah, Chattanooga. Moved, moved to Chattanooga, Tennessee. And it was like, what happened there? How did yeah. that all go down? Well, so so during this time, my wife and I, we both worked full-time jobs, and we were kind of, we were the fix and flip nights and weekends. So, like, I was consumed with, either, it was either real estate, it was real estate or real estate, right? I would come home, and we were fixing up the house, right? So we're scraping popcorn ceilings, we're, you know, we're doing all the stuff, my wife, me, you know, our two boys are helping. Um, you know, we're just doing the stuff. And then alternately, like, I'm going to meetings. And, you know, I was very invested or, you know, committed, whatever, mm -hmm. whatever, whatever words you want to use. But so we're doing house, 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 house. Um, not a ton, but like, you know, we're making an extra, you know, 40 or 50,000, right? Plus the houses we were living in, you know, though we were always on the two-year plan. So it's funny. We would, we would redecorate a house or something, right? And my wife would be like, hey, so I just want to hang some pictures. Absolutely not. Because <laughs> I'm not patching that hole later. <laughs> so for the longest time, my poor wife was never allowed to hang a picture forever. Even we just had a house built a couple years ago. And, and now there's pictures like of our grandson going down the hall. And every time I walk down the hall, I sort of look at it. And I'm like, someday I'm going to be patching those holes. <laughs> Crazy. <laughs> so anyways, but it's a squirrel brain, a squirrel mess up here. But um, so, so we're doing houses. The very last house we bought, let's talk about a little bit about the recession because I, I need to make some, some comparisons and distinctions from back then to today. But did you, did you move to Chattanooga before recession or after? After. Oh, okay. So oh, there's yes. a, there's a story. There's a, whole, about... there's a lot of stories. Okay, yeah. go for it. So um, the business that I was in, I was in outside sales for 
uh, pro build, like 84 lumber, you know, anyways. So my job was I sold to people who built, you know, big complexes, right? So, you know, we sold them doors, trim, molding, trusses, windows, garage doors, all that stuff. So what happened? And my wife, <clears throat> she was an assistant purchasing manager for Ashton Woods Homes, which is a big custom home builder. So let's say I'm, I'm selling to Pulte Homes. I don't know if you're familiar with them. Big nationwide. No? Never heard okay. of them, yeah. Big nationwide home builder, right? Well, they say, you know, we've got this package of you know, these six town homes that we build. It's the Magnolia package, right? So we would know when they say, hey, we're going to start building this. We knew what windows to order, what doors mm -hmm. to order. You know, mm -hmm. we knew all the things. Mm -hmm. Well, here's what was happening. So it's a little bit of, an, this is like an inside baseball thing. So, you know, when they were planning these things out in 2005, 2006, right? The market's crazy, like it was 18 months ago. And, you know, as they're starting to build them, they're like, oh, they were, it wasn't selling as quickly as, as, as they wanted it to. So they wanted to drop the price, but they did not want to drop the profit, right? So what we saw was amenities, or not amenities, um, the standards that they were using, maybe a solid core bedroom door. Now all of a sudden it's hollow core, right? Thick molding around the doors. Oh, maybe now it's the thin stuff. You know, five and a quarter inch baseboards or seven inch baseboards going down to three and a quarter. So we saw the standards were being lowered. And we're like, okay, things are slowing down a little. It's fine, right? But what happened was we, we, were, we were on the train tracks and the train was coming at us, but you couldn't see it. Like nobody the last time had any idea that a drop was coming. Mm. Everybody was caught by surprise. So in my wife's job, you know, she was the person that was going, oh, okay, so we're not going to put granite as a standard in every house. Now it's going to be, you know, laminate, right? And granite will be the upgrade. Still going to charge the same or really close. But anyways, so, so on the building and construction side, we started to see those things happening. And like we felt like we weren't selling quite as much, but like this was over like 18 months. Like it was very gradual, very, very slow. Whereas this time, what happened? Fed raised the rate. It was like somebody pulled the emergency brake, mm -hmm. right? Do you know why? Do you know what the difference was? What was the difference? You don't know? So that's 2007, 2008. Oh, yeah. oh all, all the subprime mortgages. Nope. nope. It's what not was that. happening? Social media. See, back then, you had the Wall Street Journal, whatever paper you read, and you had Dan Rather at, what, 5.30 or 6 o'clock mm -hmm. every night. Now what do you have? Instagram, Facebook, Snapadoodle, Snap, whatever, whatever they all are, right? So now the the just the... Uh, you know, information gets transmitted so much faster. So now information is just out there very quickly. So what happened this time is, you know, and there's 40 24 hour news channels and, you know, and news leads with bad, you know, the, with the bad news. So what happened this time is they had that rate change, Well, we had rate changes before, but all the, why was it so quick this time? Because now the information is out there. Everybody's got a phone just continuously. Right, in everybody. Pocket. Yeah, especially now more than ever. Right, and now there's more investors probably than there were before. And, you know, who does this affect? Well, this affects your guys who are fixing and flipping and rehabbing, right? Or your landlords who need to go get a, a loan to burr out of whatever project they're in. Well, those people are very invested in real estate and they're always, they're attuned to what's going on, right? Because again, you can pull out your phone and go to Bloomberg or CNN or Fox or MSNBC right, 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 or whatever right, right, right. it is, yeah. right? So they know, they knew instantly what a, what a rate change was going to do. So literally those guys just like stopped. Everybody stopped and it's panic. It's, you know, there's a lot of stuff. So that was the difference, right? So... So I knew, and I'm, I'm, I know I'm jumping ahead, like we knew something was going to happen like today. We knew we were over, probably going to go over that cliff, but we thought, oh, it's going to be gradual like it was before. It never dawned on me that, boy, this is going to happen so quickly. So that's, that's the difference. So back then, so we knew things were slowing down. We knew, well, first off, we wanted to buy multifamilies. Right. Like everybody, every single, everybody wants to every, yeah. Every real estate investor is like monopoly, right? The house to the duplex to the quad to the, to the big, to the big thing. So, so, um, and we knew that we probably wanted to do it someplace else than Orlando because Orlando is very expensive. So here's what happened. We, we buy this house. It's a probate bought this. It's a very typical Deltona block house, very Florida, you know, built in 1980. Right. You know, so we bought this house for, like 99,000, something like that. Literally the same exact house, one block over, two blocks down, had just sold for 214. Mm. That's a deal, right? 99, 214, we're going to be good, right? We're going to, you know, we're going to take this money and we're going to start investing someplace else. So in the meantime, I go to Boston. Uh, I go with my brother, Thomas, and he wanted to start investing. And uh, we go to this boot camp. 
Dave Lindahl's boot camp. Um, and it's on a, uh, investing in apartments and emerging markets. Great. So I wanted to learn about apartments. You know, there was no Tim Bratz then. There was none of these people, right? Do you know Dave Seymour? Yeah, I heard of Dave. Dave was the MC at that event. Really? Back then? Way back in the day. Like, I think um, he was still a part-time fireman at the time. So it's funny. I, did I didn't s- know that story. Oh, yeah. You didn't know he was a part-time? He was no, a fireman? No. Oh, dude. You I, know, don't, I don't know. You know he was on TV, story. right? No. I just see him like he's in he's in the masterminds yeah. he's at all the conferences. Dude, he, he had he had a show for like a season fixing up Boston. Heard of that? Him and his partner. Huh. Well, this is be- way before any of that. It's such a side note. But anyway, <laughs> so the first time I saw him in the family, I'm like, Dave, I saw you, Dave Lindahl's thing. But anyways, so Dave Lindahl, really smart, written a bunch of books. If you want to read a great book on emerging markets, um, Dave Lindahl, it's it's marketplace or uh, investing in apartments. And emerging markets, something like that. It's a really great mm-hmm, book. Mm-hmm. Maybe we can figure it out and drop it in the comments here. But yeah, absolutely. So, so with Dave, we do this four day apartment thing, I'm taking notes, trying to learn how to how to do this. But here's the last day. I'm, this guy is so smart. We're in this with this room in Boston. There's probably five six hundred people, and they're shooting up on the screen. It's a big map of the U.S. And he's got a laser pointer. And this guy's literally going city by city throughout the country, going, "Here's what's happening." This is why this market's going up. This is why this market's going down. And like by this point, like you could start to feel it more and more, right? So we're, you know, down the timeline, like we're starting to feel something, something's going on. And so he gets to Chattanooga and he says, uh, so Chattanooga, really great market, very small, 160,000 people. Volkswagen has picked Chattanooga to operate or to uh, open their first U.S. production plant. I'm like, well, that's pretty big. He said, it's going to bring in 20,000 jobs. I said, there's only 150,000 people there. That's a lot. That's a big, that's, that's bigger than more than 10%, right? And not that 20,000 people were going to work at the factory, but there's all those ancillary jobs, right? The butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker, right? The guy who drives a truck, you've got the factory, and then you've got all the suppliers. There's just a lot of jobs that come with it. I'm like, oh, that's pretty cool. He's like, but not only that, Amazon is opening up a fulfillment center there. Mm. And then another one in Cleveland, Tennessee, which is 20 miles north. I'm like, oh, Like, that's all he's talked about all day is, you know, how markets, you know, just because one market, we say the U.S., right? And, you know, by this time, Dan Rather, the nightly news, like, things aren't so good. Things are a little bad, right? So he said, you know, listen, just because the United States, you know, you hear on the nightly news that it's bad, you know, one city or one state or one county may be really doing well. And that's the whole thing with emerging markets. Like, literally, like, your neighborhood in the Bronx, all of a sudden, they're going to put a subway station there that will pop a neighborhood, right? Mm-hmm. Because people are going to be going. So lots of things that can affect it. So I'm like, wow, Chattanooga. So we're working on this house in the meantime. And, you know, drive to Birmingham. We check that out. Terrible. Montgomery, Louisville, Kentucky. And we went to Chattanooga. And I'm like, okay, I really like this. Like Chattanooga, we we like this. We're, we're I think this is where we're going to invest. So we didn't initially have the idea that we were going to move there. So we buy this last house in like July of 2008. And uh, working on it, like I put in new cabinets. I bought these knockdown kitchen cabinets where mm-hmm, you put them together. Mm-hmm. Terrible. Don't ever do that. Mm-hmm. Pay to get them, pay to put them together. But like I laid like 1,700 square foot of like tile on my hands and knees and scraped popcorn and did knock. I did all the things like because we fixed them up ourselves. So I finished this house in... Like maybe like the second week of November, I call, I have a new realtor now, Shana. I call her and uh, I'm like, hey, Shana, so we're ready with the house. Do we want to put it on the market? She's like, you know, you should probably just wait until January because it's the holidays. Nobody really moves and you don't want it just to sit on the, ho- on the market till January and then you have 40 days where nobody's bought it and it looks bad. Perfect. Makes great sense. So we're back and forth to Chattanooga. I'm with my brother at the RIA, and he's on his old, like, sidekick phone on Craigslist, and he finds this uh, duplex in Chattanooga that's for sale. So because we're in this class, he negotiates this sub-two deal with these people who had left the left and moved to, to like, Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. So, like, a lot of things are are kind of going on. Um, We end up buying this duplex. We go up there for a weekend. He he decides to stay up there and fix it up because it was vacant. And uh, now I'm going back and forth. So now time's kind of going on a little bit and we're like, oh, you know, maybe we'll just move to Chattanooga, right? So let's sell this house. So January comes around and I bring Shana in and she's like, hey, you did a good job. I'm like, I know. She says, it looks really good. I, 
no, I, you know, I know you did it. It looks great. Right. I'm like, so we're sitting like this at the kitchen table and, uh, like, so what do you think we could put on the market for? She's like, well, papers, you know, because it's before the internet. Um, I think you probably could put it on at about 144. Shayna, one block over, two block, 214. Oh, yeah, but things have changed. Market I'm like, changed, yeah. since July, 214 in July. So when it, when it did finally hit the bricks, though, it hit the bricks hard yeah. in, in Florida. I'm like... No. She's like, oh, yeah, well, look, this one, you know, right down here at the corner, it sold for, you know, 90, and then this one over here, 170, and, you know, she's like, I think 144 is your number. I'm like, absolutely not. My house is nicer than all of those because I'm such a smart new investor, right? Because I know I'm so smart because I've sold a couple of houses. I'm like, my house is nicer. It will sell for more. She's like, what do you want to do? I'm like, I'm going to tell you, I thought I was the most magnanimous motherfucker who's ever walked the face of the earth when I said, I'll let it go for 165. Because now, like, we're moving. Like, I've got this in my head, right? We're moving. She's like, okay. Like, your realtor doesn't care, right? Out she goes. Sign in the yard. Sign here. So this is January. Nothing. Not even. She doesn't even get calls. Wow. Nothing. So now February, and, like, I've told my job, like, hey, I'm probably going to leave. My wife, she, she has lost her job now. Because now, like, cuts are starting to happen. So February, I'm like, hey, Shana, I'm like, what's going on? She's like, oh, we're not getting any calls. I'm like, all right, how about 155? She's like, okay. Like, like it kind of stunned me that she was, you know, because now foreclosure. Now all those foreclosures that have been happening for so long, now they've hit, right? Yeah. We used to do foreclosure. Um, there's a company in Florida, Foreclosures Daily. Well, years oh, yeah. ago, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, they've been around forever. They're well, we sub- yeah, we subscribed to them. And I remember at like 10 o'clock every night, they would, they would go live online with all the filings across the state because they literally had somebody that would go, right? So my wife would stay up. We would mail merge because we bought this program from somebody at the RIA. We would mail merge and send out those letters the next day. And sometimes, now that's just the filing of the list pendants, right? So that doesn't mean like it made it to Joe's house. Well, sometimes our letter was getting, getting there before, mm. which makes for an awkward conversation. But anyways, so now all those foreclosures that everybody's been targeting for years, now they're coming out on the market, Yeah. right? So there was that, that time delay. So anyways, so you know, now... One, one thing that I really take away from this whole thing is that emerging markets can happen anywhere, Yeah. but you really can pay attention to where that emerging market is mm-hmm. and you, 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 you zeroed in on it you found that okay, Amazon was going there. Mm-hmm. Uh, was it Volkswagen? Yep, Volkswagen? Volkswagen, and that yeah, the population actually wasn't going to be as big as something like Miami or Jacksonville. Right. Right. But a lot of people struggle to find what that next emerging market is. It is, but it's there. Like the the data is out there if you if you know how to go look at it. And and, and so and I'm probably the biggest proponent of this book. Like every I'm always talking about it. Well, and, why don't we talk about that yeah. though? Because in this market that we're in right now, mm-hmm. that's going to be really hard. Mm-hmm. Uh, prices are, are it depends where you're at, right? right? Prices are really high, but then some are coming down. Yeah. And then some areas that you wouldn't, I mean, think to touch. I mean, especially mm-hmm. in Florida. I mean, who's going to Putnam County, right? right. Like people are buying there. Yeah. Or who's who is going to Chattanooga? Mm-hmm. Who is going to Knoxville yeah. or some of those those areas? Yeah. What are some what are some of those best strategies to finding yeah. that new emerging market mm-hmm. that you've seen from your personal side, yeah. not not just from the book, but like right. how you're analyzing that? So so here's one of the reasons that we finally decided in, on Chattanooga. So in Florida, it just it died really fast, and here's why. Florida, as a state, is like a three-legged stool. Do you know the three? You know the three industries that that Florida lives well, on. Go okay, for it. Um, entertainment, travel, yeah. Disney, yeah. Universal, yeah. right? That's yeah. easy one, yeah. right? Construction. It's a huge construction because so many people are coming here. Um, I read something. I don't want to misquote it, but it was like forty-something percent of the people in the state of Florida are somehow tied to construction. Mm. A distributor. They're the plumber. They're the electrician. The rooms to go. Like whatever. And the, the third leg is agriculture and um, livestock. You know, Florida's a big livestock state. Most people don't know. So, so what happened in the recession? 
people definitely stopped traveling. Construction stops. So the, no wonder. The, that's why the state collapsed so hard. So knowing that, when I'm looking at other markets, right, I said, well, I don't ever want to be in a position where we're exposed like that again, where if one sector dies, like even if only one of those, are, like it still would have fallen, right? Right. Because it, they were, it was so heavy. So when I looked at Chattanooga, I said, okay, like I wanted to know what's going on there. Like what is happening? And like, I will ask people that when I'm visiting someplace else, um, like, like, Hey, what's going on here? Like, where do people work? Like what, like what drives this economy? So Chattanooga, um, so Volkswagen, Amazon, there, it's a very large insurance place. We have the headquarters for Blue Cross Blue Shield for the area for Southeast or something. And Unum, which is a big multinational insurance company. Mm. They do a lot of workman's comp stuff. Okay, great. So you got that. We're also a big technology hub. You wouldn't realize that. Chattanooga was the first city in the United States that every single resident had access to gig internet. Really? So whatever that is. Right. They so we're, that. we're nicknamed Gig City. Now there's a bunch of them, but we were the very first one. It actually happened by accident. Um, our power board, EPB, the electric power board, EPB, they were trying to figure out a way to not have to go me- do meters. So they ran fiber optic to all the meters so they could read it electron, I don't know, whatever, through the internet. And then they realized, oh my God, every house is wired for mm-hmm. fiber optic. Mm-hmm. So, so that's how they brought it there. So we've got Google, Gary Vanichuk. One of his three locations is actually in Chattanooga. Really? Yes, it is. People, see, another, people, another surprise right yeah, there. Yeah, people see him walking down the road whenever he's in town. So, um, so that, the downtown of Chattanooga really went through a revitalization under Bob Corker, who was a senator. He used to be our mayor. Um, Chattanooga was one, was one of the dirtiest cities in the country. And they, it really got cleaned up. And now there's this beautiful aquarium that kind of anchors our downtown. Also, fun fact, the first Coca-Cola that was ever bottled in the United States was bottled in Chattanooga. Mm. So Another one. So also, I, I don't want to mess up the story because someone will probably correct us online, but the Lupton family actually owned that first bottling plant, but they had the rights to like all bottling or Coca-Cola. So like every Coke bottle that was bottled for a long time, they got like the smallest percentage like of a royalty. Yeah. So anyways, so Chattanooga, very diverse economy. And then North Georgia, we have all the textiles, Shaw carpet, um, all of them, like Mohawk, all those, like those carpets, like everybody, you know, your flooring probably came from North Georgia. Mm. Right. So, so very diverse economy so that if any one of those sectors like died, we would have been okay. Also, Little Debbie snack cakes. I know you don't eat those because you're skinny now, but Little Debbie snack cakes are actually produced <laughs> in, in Chattanooga. Moon pies, like you've heard of those, Chattanooga. Brock and Brock candies, Chattanooga. Lifesavers, Chattanooga. So it's this really cool, diverse economy. And the reason that all of that is there is if you look at Chattanooga on a map, is it's very centrally located. So we're directly two hours north of Atlanta, right on 75. And then you, you keep going up 75, you get to Knoxville. You go up 24, you get up to Nashville. You go down to Huntsville. So we, we're at a trucking hub as well. So there are a lot of logistics companies. Mm. So all that to be said, you talk about emerging markets. One of the reasons that, that Chattanooga is very safe as far as an investment standpoint is it's a diverse economy. Yeah, it seems that way. Yeah. It seems it's just very diverse, but it's mm-hmm. also it has opportunities for mm-hmm. other industries. Like yeah. you said, the insurance industry is over mm-hmm. there. Yeah. Um, I mean, the Coca-Cola plants or mm-hmm. whatever plant yeah. was over there. I think that plays a role into like deciding sure. where you want to go to, right. right? Do you want to focus in Miami, Florida? Or do you want to go to like a Pensacola? Yeah. Do you yeah. want to go to mm-hmm. uh, Nashville or do you want to mm-hmm. go to a, a Memphis or somewhere yeah. else, right? So that that plays a role. And I'd say that a lot of people struggle with that. Yeah. You know, it's interesting because I'm on Instagram and I get a lot of stuff, right? I, I, I get a lot of messages, messages right? Yeah. And I try to answer all of them as best I can. But, um, you know, somebody was messaging me today or yesterday. I can't remember when it was. What? Hey, can you give me some some tips on on wholesaling? I'm like, yeah, absolutely. If you're starting out with not a lot of money, go out and drive for dollars, you know, deal machine, whatever. Do you do one of those things? Well, vir- I want to do virtual. I'm like, if you're in a city with at least a hundred thousand people, stay local. I promise you, it's going to be so much easier for you than going virtual. I think people in the guru world, and we're probably a little part of that, sell this idea that you can, you know, virtual is easier, and it's really not. Right. You know? Um. It's not. It, it takes, it's harder. There are more opportunities for things to go wrong 
And the example I use for that is maybe in music, right? You obviously a very talented violin player. Um, and I don't know which side of the spectrum you're on, so you'll have to tell me. There are some people who are just gifted, right? Uh-huh. They don't have to do the practice. They don't have to do the thing. They just pick it up and they're just good, right? In whatever, the trombone, the trumpet, the flute, whatever it is, the piano. They're just those people that just, and then there are other people who have to really work at Oh, it, yeah. Right? Okay. That's the exact same. That's the difference between virtual and the local model, right, where you live. And I give the same example, right? If you're in the high school wrestling team, right, there's that one kid that could just, just power his way through it, and then you've got the other person who has technique. Again, same difference, virtual and wholesale, or virtual and the local model. If you're on local model wholesaling, right? So I'm going down the road. I'm going to go meet Mrs. Smith. I'm going to stand in the house. Like, I know that I'm going to sell this house. I can feel are the floors level. Does it smell like, you know, cats or is there sewage or, you know, what is the condition of the walls? Like, I can see it. I can, like, literally touch it, taste it, feel it. Like, I can, I'm here, right? So I get my contract signed. Oh, I go home and I'm like, oh, Mrs. Smith, I need to come back over and take some pictures from my contractor. I can run back over there and take pictures. Oh, I need a video. I can run back over. I need to show it. Oh, I can go meet my buyer. Oh, there's another buyer in an hour. Let me go meet that one, right? There's all those things that if I screw up, I can just go over there and fix it. Well, that doesn't exist in the virtual model. You better have a plan, right? Yeah. You've got one shot to go in there and get everything you need. So you you have to know what you're doing and, and you have to be a little bit strategic about it, right? And have have a process, right? We're going to send somebody in. They're going to get all the pictures. They're going to take the video. They're going to hold the phone sideways and not take them vertical. And, you know, they're going to, you know, explain to the seller that, hey, we're going to need to come back, you know, probably two more times, right? So when you're going virtual, like all of those things have to line up, right? There's no, oh, I'm going to pay someone a hundred bucks to run back over there and do this again. Does that, does that make yeah, sense? Makes Am I sense. explaining? Okay. Yeah, it so, is. you know, where it's local, I can just run over there and kind of muscle my way through it. Where virtual, you just have to have a little bit more of a plan. And what I tell people is if you're not good at local wholesaling, going virtual is going to expose every weakness you have very quickly and yeah. cost you probably a lot of money. Yeah. And, and let me ask you this. So you do, I mean, we'll get to the closing side of stuff yeah, well, because yeah. we got to talk about novations. Sure, we got to sure. talk about all that stuff. We had Corey Geary on, talked mm-hmm. all about that. Mr. Novations. Yeah. He, he's the guy that comes to you for all that stuff yeah. when it comes to dispo and closings. So we'll talk about that. Yeah. Um, but where is wholesaling going right now today? Like where, where are things really headed? Mm. Cause you know, the whole, that's a whole process. David's got yeah. a whole course on dispo and, yeah. and you'll, you'll be able to drop that too. But, sure. um, I think instead of just talking about what wholesaling is and how mm-hmm. people get in the game, yeah. where is it heading for people that do want to get started with it? Mm-hmm. And for those that are already in it. Okay. So. So we're going to go back to the market cycles a little bit. So, you know, a market, it's a bell curve, right? It goes up, it goes down, it goes up, it goes down. One thing that Lindahl says is, you know, every market cycle from point to point, whether you're measuring bottom to bottom or top to top, five to seven years for the most part, right? That's roughly about right. Texas, for some reason, has been on this incredibly long run, but most markets, five to seven years. So again, when we, when we talked about moving to Chattanooga, we're like, oh, we're going to go there. We'll buy a bunch of houses. We'll stay for five to seven years. We'll sell them. We'll go someplace else. We'll just pick another one. Well, fell in love with the city and the people, and one day you'll come visit. And but it's a great place, right? It's just it's a fabulous place. So we decided to stay. Um, but and here's one of those moments. What was the question? <laughs> Remember, I told where, you I, I get too many things going in my head. Where Where do you think oh, yes. feelings okay. going? Yeah, right. Perfect. Okay, thank you. So <laughs> I told you that would happen. So, anyways, bell curve, right? The worst and most precarious spot for a wholesaler is as we go over that that curve, right? Because what happens is sellers still think they're sitting on a pile of pure platinum, mm-hmm. right? But buyers recognize that the market's starting to drop. So they want to overcompensate. And if we're talking about price, right? Like, so, you know, 100,000, maybe yeah. maybe today's number is 80, yeah. but buyers want to be at 60 yeah. because they're scared and they don't know. So that's where we're at right now. So it's hard, right? 100%. This is the hardest spot in the marketplace to be a wholesaler um any any type of real estate yeah, right buyers are backing out of deals buyers are backing out uh, wholesalers some of them are even ghosting mm-hmm. some i just don't want to want yeah. to do it anymore i've yeah. seen that uh, yeah. happen recently all yeah. of a sudden sh- they're gone yeah right so when you have buyers that are backing out of deals mm-hmm. i mean that doesn't help your cause to yeah get in that it doesn't game. so what happened is remember they dropped the interest rate things the first thing that happened all the dumb money got out right i always say the doctors the dentists the lawyers right like, but the people who, who were like sitting on 200,000, like, oh, I'm going to buy this house. 
send my buddy over to paint it and I'm going to resell it and make 40,000, right? That's cool. No problem, right? This isn't the same as 2008 with the, the, the fake mortgages and all that. So those were the first people out because that, the, that was the easy money. They got scared and they're like, nope, I'm going to put my money someplace else. Real estate isn't the best gamble anymore. So they got out. Some hedge funds bailed out quick. People talk about hedge funds a lot and they con confuse it. There's two types of hedge funds, right? It's very, they're very important distinction. There were the flipping hedge funds, Zillow. Turns out Zillow was pretty smart. Everybody goofed on them, but mm -hmm. they got out early, right? So that type of hedge fund was the buy, fix, flip, buy, fix, flip, right? They wanted to, they wanted to cycle through as quickly as they could. But then they're different. They're buy and hold hedge funds. Those people are still here buying. The fix and flip people, they got out. They got right? out. Yeah. And temporarily, like they'll probably come back. Zillow may not, but you know, there are, there are some big, big ones that, you know, or they were in 150 markets. Now they're down to 25, right? They've just, they've gotten a little bit more conservative. So where are we at with wholesalers right now? So for us and our company, we just hired a sales manager. We're going to six acquisitions, six dispositions. We're like doubling down because I know that at some point we're going to come out of this, right? And I think... Again, nobody knows. My guess is at the beginning of the year, right? Yeah. I think we'll probably, they'll raise interest rates one more time. Then there'll be a little bit of a panic and they'll, they'll probably maybe drop it a quarter just to kickstart the, I don't know, right? Who knows, right? My guess is as good as anybody else's. We'll never know exactly where we're at in the market cycle for three to five years when we can look back and go, oh, this was the top, right? That house that I sold and made 100000 that was the top of the market in Florida, but we didn't know. We didn't know that. We didn't know that for years. Yeah. You know, now looking back, I'm like, oh, we put it out at 329 and we sold it for 314. You know, I was wondering what the problem was. Well, that's what it was. So in hindsight, so three years from now, we'll know exactly where we're at. We could just be in this little dip and then shoo, takes off again. Yeah, it right? takes off again. Who knows, and, right? And, and the house that you should have bought in uh, mm -hmm. Palm Beach County just goes through the roof, right? right. It, once again. Yeah, I think uh, that's kind of where the market's, market's in like a weird flux right yeah. now. Um, I've seen it on my end with probates mm -hmm. that have actually some probates we've gotten done. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden now the buyer. buyers are not non-existent yeah. and now wholesalers looking around going, well, what do we do? What's next? You know, yeah. and, and so many people that will be watching, I'm sure can relate to that because yeah. it's just it's hard or some now. Uh, I don't know, maybe this kind of transitions into something for you is that some are because they're really good by going direct to seller. Mm -hmm. They're just holding on to the deals, Could be. flipping them, yeah. either keeping them or doing mm -hmm. some kind of Airbnb mm -hmm. or doing a long-term hold. Right. Um, what are you seeing with that world? So it's interesting. You're probably in a lot of Facebook groups with investors like I am. And for years, people have been crying, I can't wait for the market to change. And when this market changes, I'm going to buy every property in the world. And now it's those groups are filled with a bunch of crybabies. Like you MFers have been begging for this to happen begging for it, right? And us experienced guys who've been around for a while, like, yeah, it'll happen. It's not going to be like you think it's going to happen, but here we are. So back to the original question, can you still wholesale today? Yes. You have to be, if, you know, before you need to be at 70 cents on the dollar, dude, you got to be at like 55, 60 cents on the dollar because you've got to overcome that fear that your buyer has. So it's got to be a real deal. You know, the when the transition first happened, we had some like pretty houses at 80 cents on the dollar in Phoenix and Las Vegas mm -hmm. and Fernandina Beach and, you know, that would have sold six months before, but when the market tightened up, like people are like, nope, I can't get it discounted deep enough. So one, there are deals to be had. You have to be really good at being direct to the seller. Now, again, remember the, the bell curve, like why that's a precarious spot is your buyers are looking ahead at the pricing, but your sellers still think they're sitting on gold. Right, right? absolutely. So what has to happen is, and this is what took, a long time in Florida, right? For those prices to come down. Well, now, because again, information is a lot quicker. Um, we're getting calls from sellers who understand, like almost in a little bit of panic in their voice, like my house has been listed for 30 days and I don't have nine offers and 50 over, over value plus a trip to Baja, right? You know, the, like pe sellers are starting to realize that. So once sellers realize it, it catches up, that's what will normalize the market. So my hope is that we dropped into that curve very quickly is that we'll come out of it quicker and it won't take us 18 months. Boy, what a time to buy if you're a cash buyer, though. It's coming up. It's coming really it's soon. Feel, it feels it's like right you, now, you know? Well, you you just need those sellers to come off their number, right? For Because for, what you want is equilibrium in a market, right? What we had before, 
that running at that 45 degree angle, unsustainable. Yeah. Right. 100%. Yeah. Like, I don't know that what the Fed did was right, but somebody had to do something. We could not, absolutely we would have burned this thing up, right? Like, I don't know what would have happened, but it could not go forever. Yeah. Like, no matter who was in power, like, somebody had to change something. Well, let's talk about that yeah. while, while we're on it, right? Yeah, talk yeah. about the Fed and raising yeah, rates. Yeah. Uh, uh, hopefully, by the time the episode comes out, I, 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 hopefully it's not at 8%, right? right? Like, hopefully it's, like, staying the way yeah. it is. But um, I would say that uh, the way the Fed's going, they're going to raise it again. Yeah. Right? The way that things because are Because inflation going, still today is still still going on. Yeah. But let me ask you this out. Do you know what the average um, home borrower interest rate has been over the last 50 years? What's that? You don't know? Guess. Just guess. Borrower interest rate, 5 6%? So I'll tell you this. When when I lived in Boston, or I lived in, actually in Drake at Massachusetts, when I was in high school, my parents' first mortgage, or not first mortgage, but the mortgage then was like 17 and change. 7.7% is the average over the last 50 years. Hmm. When I got that last loan on that probate house, the seven, the ninety seven thousand, you know, right, right, seven percent. I thought I was the fucking man getting a seven percent loan. And here are all these other people that are Crying getting now. two and a half, three percent. It's awesome. I refied my house for a two point two. <laughs> I love it. Thank God I did. I wish I'd have been smart enough to buy more stuff. I had a really smart friend of mine, Jeff Holst. He's an attorney, and he bought like he he got like ten million dollars in loans on apartments and stuff. So it was super smart, but. Here's the thing. Life is going to go on. Life's going to go on. People bought and sold houses at 10% interest. They did, right? Because why? People still get transferred. Death, divorce, taxes, probate, like all those things still oh, yeah, happen, yeah. right? Life is going to go on. Yeah, we were in the hottest real estate market in a long time. So why would somebody sell to a wholesaler? Because life still happens. The same reason you take a $12,000 watch in and go pawn it for a grand, right? Life happens. So people are still going to buy houses. Is it going to be at that crazy frenzy? No. What was happening, my interpretation of that frenzy is people were moving up. And that's cool, mm-hmm. right? I'm going to get the nicer house because, you know, the rates are cheap and I can afford to buy more. But, you know, so what is it going to do? Is it going to bring that price down a little bit to something that's more stable? Yeah, but that's not a crash. That's just normalization. Yeah. Right? What would you say to those people out there that are seeing the Fed that keeps raising the rates and... It's holding them back from wanting to either get into investing mm-hmm. or holding them back from getting more deals. Yeah. Or maybe uh, is it a time for people to pivot and change their system mm-hmm. to doing something different? Yeah, I think it's always a good time to buy real estate. Um, you know, I've got plenty of notes that are at yeah, six and seven percent owner finance notes. So if you're going to to buy, no matter what the interest rate is, right? Like, oh gosh, what do they call it? There's a thing where you, they say to buy crypto or stocks, but buy it consistently over mm-hmm, time because mm-hmm. it's going to average out. If you're buying today, even at 7% or if it's 8% or if it's 10%, am I cash flowing at that number? If you're cash flowing, buy the deal, right? Because what, it, and buy it, you, this is, was the problem back then in the last recession was people were on adjustable rates, right? Don't, don't do that. But if you're on a fixed rate, a fixed mortgage rate, and even at 8%, right, it fixed means it's going to be the same payment for 10, 15, 20, right. 30 years, whatever right. you're whatever you're doing. <clears throat> and you can stretch it out to, to drop that payment. Um, but what are rents gonna do? Rents go up, 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 up. You can, you can search that, like Zillow, HUD, uh, Apartment Finders. I, I did it for one of the courses. We searched, uh, you know, historically, rents have gone up, same thing, at like a 45 degree angle. So if it's cash flowing today at $200, in three years, it's going to be four hundred dollars. It's just going to keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And then maybe rates come down later, and you have the opportunity to refi and and, and increase that cash flow. But you know that happened to us. We I know we're probably jumping way ahead, but we did end up buying a bunch of properties in Chattanooga, and properties that I bought that had one hundred fifty dollars cash flow are now seven hundred, mm. seven hundred fifty. Right. So again, it's not the end of the world. Life is going to go on. This is the new normal. Two percent was not normal. No, a lot of people said that was like absolutely not normal. No. Some people have said that we're never going to see that again. I, I don't know. Who, who knows? Yeah, right? who knows? Right? I, I mean, never really happened before. It's not something that has happened at all. I mean, it yeah. was. I mean, it happened for a lot of reasons. We had COVID. We needed to, you know, I think, I know we're probably jumping ahead, but, you know, during COVID, I thought finally the market's going to crash. 
I'm going to buy a bunch more owner finance deals. Here we are. We're ready. And it defied all logic. Like for three weeks, it stopped. And then just kept on going because they dropped interest rates, right? That's got to be the reason. So will they drop interest rates to that again? I doubt it, right? Like, I doubt it. That was awesome. Hopefully, everybody took advantage and bought some some stuff and got some long-term financing. Yeah. But that's not a normal world, yeah, right? Yeah, right. It was a blip in time. But for so many of our investors who got into real estate or wholesaling or whatever, because it was so fun and crazy and hot, like, that's not normal. You know? And when when this, when this st- first started happening, like, I had investors calling me because, you know, we trained dispo teams to, to sell deals. And, like... People that were on Instagram, like, oh, you guys, you know, six months ago, you guys are stupid if you're not doing five hundred thousand dollars a month, and they're, you know, they're driving around their Lambo and they're like twenty four, right? Talk being real cocky. Well, they were the first people to panic because they're like, oh my god, stuff's not selling. Well, yeah, like you had a business and you were doing a thing, but it was, it was only you had a business because interest rates were two percent. Mm-hmm. Now we're starting to see a real separation between the people who are lucky and the people who actually have a business and a plan and understand how to do marketing and talk to buyers and sellers and all that type of stuff. Yeah. Well, one thing I love talking to you about is when we start getting into like the creative side yeah. of deals, right? So when mm. we, when we get into a market like this with interest rates, yeah. uh, we start talking about creative financing or creative structuring or yeah. seller terms, but also we start really talking about the niches that other people are starting to get into mm. because they tend to be opportunities, yeah. right? Probate being one of them that everybody wants to focus on. Um, maybe weird things with creative financing and, yeah. and getting into those deals. But also one of the hot ticket topics that has been just blowing up lately. I, I actually got another email today on it, which is Novations. Yes. We have to talk about Novations yeah. because... It's coming up as an alternative, uh, and and when Corey Geary was talking about this on on yeah. one of my episodes, um, the big takeaway for me was almost like transparent wholesaling mm-hmm. in a way, right? Like being yeah. full disclosure wholesaling, but also you're not having to offload it to a buyer. You're almost playing the middleman to go f- just find the buyer, yeah. and then f- securing your position. Mm-hmm. Tell us, because you were commenting on the, on the episode too. We, yeah. we love when you were. Uh, <laughs> tell us the novation world, because the okay. novation world can, some people, they're like, oh, I've heard that word. I've heard the term. Yeah. I understand it contractually, but what does it mean real estate wise? Yes. And also putting the pieces and puzzle into place, right? It's just like. It's a lot. It's a lot to digest yes. when you're like, oh, I want to do novations. Yeah. How? Yeah. What? Who do we go to? Who do we need to bring? Like, we got to know what that's all about. Tell us that. Okay. That's a lot of stuff. And I'm going to tell you first, <laughs> I'm not the Novations guy. If you want if you want to learn about Novations, you go to NovationNation.com. That's our friend Corey Geary. Yes. And he's probably the, the premier guy to teach Novations. Um, but you're on the, you I see am, the back I am, end, I am, I know, like, but, but I don't teach it like, like he does. Yeah. But we can definitely talk about yeah. it. So, so here's what I will say. Um, our job as a real estate investor, right? My job, especially in wholesaling, is we are here to help people, period. We're here to help sellers and we're here to help buyers. Both of them have a pain point, right? So typically most people think about sellers having a pain point. And here's what I'll tell people. If you go to the top of any tall building in your city with a good slingshot and a bag of marbles and you start shooting those in a half mile radius around wherever you're at, wherever you're at, within one mile, you will hit somebody who's losing sleep tonight about that house mm. for whatever reason, right? Death, divorce, taxes, get my kid out of jail, like all the things, right? Like I've done over 1,500 wholesale deals. You know, somebody's got cancer, get my kid, literally get my kid out of jail was a thing. You know, I'm leaving, divorce, job transfer, all the things, right? Somebody's losing sleep. So our job as wholesalers, you know, or, you know, somebody who's buying to fix and flip, right? We're still here to solve a problem. So, um, and this will probably lead to, to like more stuff if you want to talk about creative financing, but you know, our, again, our deal as a wholesalers, I want to, I want to flip, I want to flip the property. <laughs> so I know I've been trying to like, kind of keep it, keep it close. <laughs> but, sure. So, um, as a wholesaler, the first best, easiest option for us is, oh, I can pay you $80,000 for your house because in my head, I know that I can sell it to an investor for a hundred. He can fix it up and sell it for 200, but I want to, I want to buy it for, for 80,000. And you're like, David, I just, I can't, 
I can't do that because I got a mortgage at 90. So now my cash offer didn't work. Well, I don't take your lead and crumple it up and throw it over my shoulder and let's go to the next person. So this is where people who have a little more experience and a little bit of training, which is that stuff that we got at the RIA or from you know mentors or coaching, right? Well, now I look and I say, okay, so, and again, at this point, we've got rapport. I know why you're selling. I know your timeline. I know all of the things, right? So now I look at my tool belt and say, okay, what is the thing that solves your problem, right? So maybe you own this house free and clear. And I say, Al, let me ask you a question. I know you really want 90,000. I'm at 80 or I'm at 60, whatever it is. Let me ask you a question. Do you need all the money at once? And then you answer. Maybe the answer is yes. You know, yes, I've got three, mm-hmm. I, I've got three other heirs and everybody wants to be paid. Or no, you know, I really don't. Great. Now we're gonna pull pull out a, you know our creative financing tool. Or, you know, hey, I've got to get, you know, I need to move, like we're doing a deal like on this right now. Um, I'm getting transferred. I bought the house six months ago. Now the market's changing, and I owe probably more than what it's worth by the time I would sell it with a realtor, right? So maybe now the tool that I pull out is subject to. Maybe you've got some equity. You're not in a super big rush. You don't want to take my cash offer, but you are motivated. You do want to get it done, but you're not like speed isn't your issue. Mm -hmm. You just don't want to fool with selling it. Maybe that's where I pull out the novation hammer, drill, screwdriver, whatever whatever it is. Whatever it is, yeah. Whatever the tool is. So, so, and here's where I'm going to call, it's a cautionary tale, right? Don't go out and learn all of those, for, you know, go learn, <clears throat> learn to wholesale, learn to make cash offers. And then when that doesn't work, then you start to add in some of these other strategies, or maybe it's a lease option. Um, but yeah, so you've got lease option, creative, sub to um, whatever, novations, right? So now you just have alternate strategies where I can help somebody solve their problem. Now, if they're not motivated, you can't, you know, if they're just, oh, I just want to know what, you know, what I could get for it. Well, that's not somebody that's going to do anything with you, right? Yeah. So... Um, and again, now we're at the point where I think that I answered the question, no, but, you, but you, yeah, well, I'll say this. So I think the, the bigger takeaway on your end of things yeah. is having those options and tools mm-hmm. at your disposal, yeah. uh, versus, uh, just trying to go all in either on one strategy. Right. right. And I think I've talked about that too. I, mm-hmm. I don't know who it was on the episodes or even mm-hmm. out and speaking at doing conferences. Yeah. When you're getting into deals, you have to think the wide spectrum mm-hmm. of what your exit strategy is, yeah. right? Um, talk to us about that. I mean, this is this goes right. to exit strategy. Sure. Everybody's so worried about let's get the contract. Oh, we're under contract. Now let's let's close yeah. the deal, right? Yeah. None of now, it matters till you get paid. Well, that true, mm-hmm. but you close the deal or yeah. you have the property, you're thinking, mm-hmm. well, maybe we're going to wholesale right. it to somebody else, right. you know, and, and do a train. Mm-hmm. What's your exit strategy, right. right? You can't just jump into that deal. Mm-hmm. And novations is one thing, yep. right? Creative terms and, mm-hmm. and doing seller financing is a whole other thing. Yeah. Exit strategy. Yeah. So every one of those things that we laid out all has like 10 different exit strategies with the exception of novations, right? So novations are, and again, this is Corey's thing, so I'm not going to even pretend to teach it here. Go to novationnation.com. But um, yeah, the exit strategy there is, hey, this person doesn't want to fool with dealing with the realtor, dealing with the showings or maybe making repairs. So that's where we can step in. We can contract it make sure you've got the right paperwork. This isn't something you want to wing. Um and then, you know, we'll list it on the market and we'll kind of sell it on their behalf, right? Is the mm-hmm. easiest, I think, mm-hmm. way to, mm-hmm. so so that your exit strategy is we're going to, you know, we're going to get this property sold for the highest amount possible. So novations come in where I wanted to offer you 80, but you really wanted, you know, 98,000, right? More than would make sense as a cash offer. And you have, um, you're not interested in doing subject to, you're not interested in being tied to the property. You just want out and you want a little bit more money, but you're a little bit flexible on how we do it, right? You just, like, I just, it's a concierge service, right? That's what Corey Mm -hmm. calls it. So here's the question most people are asking. Well, why would somebody do that? I don't know. Why'd you go to Olive Garden instead of making your own pasta? Why don't you go out there and get get a little tub and go change your own oil, right? Why don't we do any of those things, right? Why did you call someone to come in and screen your back porch? You could certainly have gone to Home Depot and got the parts, right? Because it's convenience. Mm-hmm. It's a concierge service, right? Mm-hmm. That's why, right? There's no better explanation than that. So 
Novations, you know, we can step in, we can help them get it sold, we can get them that amount. You know, maybe you want 98,000, but I know that, you know, maybe this thing is in livable condition. It may not be updated, right? It may still look like grandma's house. It could still have green tile, but functionally it's fine, right? The outlets work, doesn't leak, doors close, you know. So that is a financeable property, right? A convent, you can get co conventional financing on it, and I can sell it on the market for maybe 130, right? Now I can collect that spread. Right. right. So that's how novations work. The other ones, again, different tool for different different strategy. Um, let's say I'm going to get you to finance the property for me. You're going to be the bank, right? Because remember when I asked you, do you need all the money at once? And here's what I tell people. Slow down when you're talking to people, right? Like when I'm talking to somebody about any of these strategies, I kind of in my mind, I've got like, you've got a little like thought bubble above your head, right? Because... Um, and who who is it that that said this? Um, when you're when you're talking to when you're talking to your seller, I say it's Ryan Stuman, but it might be might be somebody else. But when I'm presenting some of this stuff to you, like we're well trained or we've been to the the things, like we've done all the RIA things or whatever it is, the education, like this is very easy for me. But you've never heard this, right? Any of these things that I'm going to talk to you about, this is going to be the first time you've ever ever heard it, right? Mm -hmm. So. That's, you know, when I, you know, can you take 80? No. And I lean in, I'm like, well, let me ask you a question. Do you need all the money at once? It's got, it's like the first time I've ever thought about it, right? Because right. it's like the running game in football. We got to slow, slow we got to slow down, mm -hmm. right? So, well, no. Okay. You know, there might be a way I can get you the hundred if you're a little bit flexible. I might be able to get you your number because obviously I know numbers, what's important to you, right? So, so anyway, so, so that's how we, we sort of get into these, these types of, of different strategies, but to go to end to, um, you know, exit strategy, well, with creative deals, like now let's just say we agree and you're going to finance this property to me. When I can keep it forever and rent it, or maybe I just finance it for you from you over six or eight months while I fix it, flip it. Right now, I have leverage. Right, I don't have to go out and get a hard money loan or private money loan or bank loan or whatever it was. Um, you know, maybe I can take it and put an owner finance mm -hmm. person. I can wrap it, or I can lease option it, or you know, I can do all of the different things. So I have a lot of options on how I can make money. Same thing, subject to I buy your house, subject to. I can lease option it to somebody. I could wholesale it, which I don't like to do that for so many reasons, but, um, or maybe I just keep it as a rental or right. Like now I have all these alternate strategies and even within all of those, if I decide I want to rent it, well, I could do student housing. I right. could do, you know, um, some type of niche, you know, alcohol recovery house or, you know I mean? They're just the, the, the options are limitless on how you can actually make money. Yeah. I think when you're getting into seller terms or creative yeah. financing, it's the, educating the seller part mm -hmm. that you just mentioned mm -hmm. in more of a applicable realistic approach mm -hmm. which is slowing it down and educating them on yeah. here's the alternative can you take payments mm -hmm. do you need all the money now Dude, that's the simplest thing and one thing that that people do is they get verbal diarrhea they just blah, 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 blah. they just want to talk so much and they want to show people how smart they are like we had a president who got elected who talked at a third grade level because that's what most of our country mm -hmm. is. Mm -hmm. It's sad, but right. You do not want to ever, you know, get on the phone with somebody like, Hey, yeah. So I got this really cool thing where I can take over your mortgage payment. Don't worry about doing on sale, but yeah, I can take that over and we'll close it. And we'll, and we'll do all that. What, what, yeah. what, yeah. what a confused mind says. No. One of the greatest quotes my brother ever had a confused mind says no. Right. So that's why we slow it down because even though I clearly understand all of these things, you could probably start talking to me about probate stuff and just you just blow me out of the water. And I'm relatively okay with this, but it's still too much because I don't understand it all day. You know, it's not what I do every day. So when we're talking to people, like if you do not ever try to show someone how smart you are, honestly, because then they're going to start asking questions and you're just going to get into this whirlpool of just stuff spiraling down. How can I solve your problem? Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Al, here's the thing. You know, I know you, you know, I asked you about, you know, what you liked about being a landlord, and that was that you liked getting the payments, right? The thing that you told me you hated was dealing with tenants, right? Dealing with trash and tenants, tenants, trash and toilets and all those things. Man, 
Wouldn't it be great if there was a way to get the payments and not have to deal with the tenants? Mm-hmm. Right? Every one of them is going to go, absolutely. Yep. Hmm. I might have a, I'm, hmm. I'd rather buy it with cash, but I might have something that'll work. Do you feel that pacing where it just, you just got to slow mm-hmm. down, right? And because if you say too much, you're just going to confuse people. People do business with people they know, like, and trust. Yeah, and they want to hear, like, the real side of things, Yeah, too. They want to know. Here's how I can help you. I'd rather buy it with cash, but your house doesn't qualify. The best I, you know, I'm an investor. I need to make a million dollars off every property, right? They laugh, you laugh, the toaster laughs, everybody laughs. But here's another way that I think I can solve your problem. If you don't need all the cash at once, I think I can get you that number. Mm. Would that work? So, I mean, those are strategies. Yeah, yeah. Right, slowing it down. I mean, mm-hmm. that's a big one right there. I think a lot of people would would say, oh, that's probably obvious. But when you're in the moment dealing with people, it's hard to slow it down. Everybody wants to zoom and speed it up. Right. So I'm going to tell you now, I'm saying that, and I sound like the smartest guy ever. People are like, yeah, that makes sense. You know why I had to do it? Because I got so nervous, right? I See, I'm like, I was shaking like these microphones. Like, I I remember doing my first Subject 2 deal, and and like, I was was freaking, freaking out, like, as it's happening. And like, I had to, like... Hmm. You heard the expression like say less and, and not be, or what is it? Say less and be thought, thought a fool, say more and like remove all doubt. Well, that was like, you know, I'm like, if I don't say a lot, hmm, yeah, you know, like, you know, if you started talking about law stuff, I'm like, oh yeah, that's interesting. Yep. Mm-hmm. Like say less. And that's sort of how it evolved. I like, because I would get, just get nervous and I would, you know, kind of clasp my hands and go, Hmm. I think about that, you know? Yeah. That's a hard thing though, right? If I could talk to you about probate for hours, sure. you know, but it could be complicated. It hey, can absolutely. get crazy wacky. Yeah. Um, but when you're able to make a complicated subject easy yeah, or really just simplify it, water it down mm-hmm. to you- the basics, you don't need to tell somebody every single thing. And Alan, when we're done, before we get this closed, I'm going to have a title search and they're going to do an abstract and they're going to, don't need to know they that. don't know they well no. they don't know they don't want to know they they, or it's just too much how am i solving their problem yeah that's what it comes down to yeah we are in the people business yeah we are solving people's business or yeah. problems right that's all that we're doing yeah no and and that that really transitions us to another world of it's not what you're doing on an exit strategy it's not the strategy of what you're doing on a deal when a market's crazy and weird and uh, maybe it's not something you want to do Airbnb on, but you want to do creative financing. Yeah. But now the messy title world. Yeah. Right? So so many so many great deals mm-hmm. happen because the title's messed up and yes. people don't want to take the time to uh, get with an attorney to deal with it, get with the title company to find out how to overcome it. Yeah. Um, many times people just just get wrapped up in, oh, this is going to be too complicated and too much, Mm -hmm. right? And title, messy title, whether it's probate, whether it's something like a cloud on title, um, maybe there's a a missing trust Mm -hmm. uh, or a trustee is dead. We've seen those those keep popping up lately. Uh, But other things that pop up with nuisance liens and judgments that Mm -hmm. are still there, those are are deal killers. Mm -hmm. I would call them more deal stoppers because stoppers right right yeah i don't i don't think they're killers because mm-hmm. every the, if there's room in a deal yeah. there's a, there's a, a number of ways we can get this thing solved right well listen you know as an investor one of the greatest things that that i was again at an event right and somebody you know d- d- you know hey listen, you have to like have good self-talk and all these things like there's always a way yeah there's always a way to fix everything yeah now is the juice worth the squeeze that's a different question and maybe the juice might be worth it for me. That's not worth it for him. And then there may be juice for you that I wouldn't mess with, right? Because yeah. you're such an expert in probates. You would fool with something that I wouldn't. Um, but yeah, in our business, right? We are in a very weird business, right? We are. We typically we deal with the crap of the world, right? So, um, so let me say this first, right? What we do is strange. On the best day, the average person, if you go into Walmart at 10 o'clock on a Friday night, none of them have any idea how to sell a house, right? This is why realtors have a place. Realtors will always have a place to hold somebody's hand through that process. Well, but that's the clean stuff. That's the easy stuff. 
Not every deal we do as investors is going to be easy. Some are, those are awesome, but most aren't, right? Most have some conundrum that's gonna pop up where grandma deeded it to her niece on a Staples quick claim deed that's worthless, yeah. that, you know, yeah, title changed, but can we get clear title or do any of those things? So yes, you have to be able to work through those issues and be able to step back sometimes and go, okay, what is the answer here? How do we clean this up? And I remember early on in Chattanooga, I won't name check him, but we were dealing with this one title company that had been around forever. And this one attorney, we called him Dr. No. Because <laughs> every oh, time boy. we would send him something, it would be like, no, you're not gonna be able to do it. I'm like, okay, we'll call him Bob. It's not Bob, but we'll, okay. But what can we do? Well, I guess you could do this. Oh, we could do that and get clear title? Yeah. So we don't have to do probate. We can get an affidavit. We'll do all these couple things. Yeah. Great. What the fuck did you just tell me that to start with, right? But every answer was just no. So we had to get that mentality of, oh, okay, how can we work through this, right? Uh, and even us, right? There is a limit like where we'll stop. Or someone like Carl. Still yes, yeah, yes. Yeah, That's yeah, where I stop. Yeah. Who is probably one of the smartest, great guys at doing these kind of wacky title issues. Like they would take that on. Like they'll work a deal for a year or two. Like we're a relatively high speed wholesale company. So there is a limit mm. even for what we will do. But yes, most problems can be worked through. Is it, you know, is the juice worth the squeeze for you and your business? Maybe yes, maybe no. But so many people, um, they just stop when they don't, when they hit, hit that first roadblock. Because, you know, a lot of investors are new, right? Like if there's a pyramid of like hierarchy of investors, like there's very few people at the top that have been doing this for 20 years, right? There's just not, right? It makes more sense that, sense that the base of, the bulk of investors are newer investors and you know, kind of gets into a little bit of easy and why we started that company. So many of them, like they're great at talking to people, buyers and sellers and making deals, but then they turn that contract in and they're like, oh, well, there's this issue, there's this lien that, you know, maybe this mortgage company, it doesn't exist anymore, but we need a release and what do we do and how do we fix these types of things? And so many of these investors are working with Dr. No at their local title companies like, Nope, can't close this one, can't get clear title. And they just throw that contract away mm -hmm. and maybe that was $30,000. Interesting, right? yeah. I mean, and it happens where- All the time. Some, you know, it. I think the approach now more that I've seen is it's possible to get those deals mm -hmm. solved, right? It's possible to Everything do, is possible. Well, right? yeah. Because at the end of the day, the, you know, the fail safe is we'll just do a quiet title, right? Like there is an answer. Oh, oh, yeah. I mean, that's not my first preference. Yeah, but, no, you me know, either, dude. As somebody who's been through one, it wasn't, it it's, wasn't it's, fun at all. It's rough, right? Yeah. It's expensive. It's long. But, yeah. I mean, somebody told me today, they're like, oh, what do you think? I said, well, it's seven probates. Mm -hmm. And they were like, seven? They're like, seven. yeah. I said, I have no problem doing <laughs> seven. I, listen, I bill by the hour, buddy. I'm, I'm good. Uh, but, mm -hmm. you know, let me tell you what the price tag is. Yeah. And then also let me tell you what's involved. Mm -hmm. And as soon as that came out, I was like, oh, no, we don't want to even want to get into that. Well, here's the thing. There's a solution mindset, right? When you're getting into those deals mm -hmm. with thinking about, wait a second, we can bring specialists in. We yeah. can bring people in that can help yes. get this done. But also it's got to close. Yeah. You know, and that's and that's what's beautiful about what you're thinking through and easy REI closings and mm -hmm. what, you know, what everybody's doing over there mm -hmm. is thinking through the whole puzzle, right? Yeah. Remember, um, Hannah called me about this one deal one mm -hmm. time and she said, Hey, this is crazy. The law, this lawyer, he won't get back to us or yeah. something, something happened. Oh. And she was thinking about what do we need to do yeah. to close it? And that's what mm -hmm. you've trained yes. everybody to think about. Mm -hmm. Tell everybody that's watching, you know, how should people really start looking at these deals when you have probates and you have yeah. a quiet title and it's not just about picking it up under contract, but also mm -hmm. facilitating with the title company, getting yes. with them to help facilitate and say, these are documents that we need, right? Mm -hmm. Or th this is what we're going to need to, to be able to progress the case mm -hmm. or pre progress to closing. Yeah. Thinking about what that is at the end. Right. So a couple things there, but, and I'll come back to that. Don't let me forget that. But when you talk about specialists, because I, I wanted to, we talked about this a little earlier and I wanted to, to kind of dive into it. So yes, there's a cost of doing business, mm -hmm. right? People are like, oh, I don't want to get hard money because it's 15% and, you know, listen, 
in your business, if you are a rehabber, that is just a cost of doing business. It's mm-hmm. just like hiring the plumber, the electrician, the flooring guy, right? Because you could not do this deal if you did not have that hard money lender to do to do your business, right? You, you know, like you would do one house at a time instead of five at a time, right? So it's just a cost of doing business. When we were rehabbing a lot, people would come to me and say, why don't you get your realtor's license? Because then you can list it yourself. And I'm like, no, that's not what I'm good at. That's not my business, right? Because let's say I did go spend 18 weeks or whatever it takes to get a realtor's license. Now I'm fielding calls from agents and doing paperwork and nonsense. And what am I not doing? Going and buying my next house, right? So, you know, we understood that from a very early point. Like, let the probate people do do the probate job, right? Let let the best let get the best realtor I can to list my properties, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. Funny story, we uh, had this, a couple of partners early on, and we bought this house in Cleveland, Tennessee. I know I'm gonna forget to come back to your original question, so don't forget it. <laughs> but so, but it ties in. So we uh, we're in Chattanooga, Cleveland, Tennessee is 30 miles north. So we bought this house sub two. We took over the mortgage. So we went up there and looked at it, and this is like the one or three bedroom, one bath, like cute little box house, 900 square foot, relatively new, new siding, new window, like cute, like very new, mm-hmm. didn't need much. Mm-hmm. So we're like, oh, we're going to, we're going to buy this sub two. And uh, my buddy's like, yeah, I'll just do a quick claim deed. We'll quick claim it into a trust. It'll be fine. No need to go to the title company and pay them $600. Like, oh, okay. It's a quick claim deed, right? How complicated could it be? Right. The new investor says four times we resubmitted that, that, Quick claim deed. Finally, on the fourth time, we, we went to our friend at the title company and I said, Patty, would you please clean this up for us? Because we're apparently too stupid to figure out how to do a quick claim deed. For whatever reason, it just kept getting kicked out, kicked out, kicked out. So, you know, kind of goes to your story of hiring specialists, right? Just do what you're good at, right? Mm-hmm. That's Bob, Olga, do the thing you're good at, really the thing that you love and you specialize in. Do not try to be out there trying to nickel and dime your business and try to save a dollar and do everything yourself. Right. Right. You're not going to be successful. Right. I have, a, I think I have the best dispo training material and courses out there. I've trained a lot of the biggest teams in the country. Right. A lot of big teams that, that we know about, but I bring in somebody else to do acquisitions training for my team because I'm good, but I want the best. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I don't, I don't do my own transaction coordinating. I couldn't even tell you when the last time I've had to get on the phone with a, with a, you know, a title company, unless it was in the, as the owner of Easy, and I've got to have a conversation with somebody. Right, right. But like, I don't do that on a daily. I have a company that does it for me. Right. Like literally, I'm the owner, but I'm also their first client. Um, you know, I don't list my properties. I would never try to figure out probate. I'm calling my buddy Al. Al, I know you're golfing, man. You know, living the dream down there in Florida, but got a little issue, right? Yeah. So that is a, that's, a, I don't know if it's a mentality issue or what it is where, um, cause I had this issue too, at the beginning where I can do everything myself. I don't want to hire anybody that costs money. I can save money. I can, and I get like some of that to a point when you're starting out and you just, you have no money. Right. Cause I started out like broke. Like even when I moved to Chattanooga, like all that money, other money was gone. We started out broke, 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 but you, you have to let experts do, do their job. Right. Yeah. Cause you're not going to do it as good as them. You're not going to do it as fast as them. And you know, time, time has a value. Absolutely. I mean, if you get with people that don't know what they're doing, oh. I mean, your, your deal could be Gosh. Uh, in the pile for a year to two yeah. years. I mean, have people that that'll tell me that they didn't get with the right attorney on something mm-hmm. and now it's two years in. Yeah. Right. Or they didn't get with the right title company and now mm-hmm. it still won't close eight months later right. or nobody's gotten their checks all of a sudden. Right. Yeah. You know, yeah. so yeah. Um, choosing the wrong person is terrible. Right. Like I said earlier, there are great realtors. They're bad realtors. Yeah. Wholesaling. The great thing about wholesaling, very low barrier of entry. Anybody can do it. The bad thing about wholesaling, also a very low barrier of entry, and anybody can do it. Everybody can do it. So there are good wholesalers, there are bad wholesalers. I'm sure there are great attorneys, and there are some that you're like, oh my God, please don't ever let that person touch any kind of legal paperwork again, right? They're they're just horrible. So yeah, you know, get references and deal with the right people to get your business done. Yeah. And and that messy title world comes up, you know, All all the all the time. Yeah. I can't tell you how many deals I've seen people also pass over mm-hmm. sure. because because of that, right? Yeah. I mean, there's one that came up even today mm-hmm. um, where the, the lady, she just never got anybody the stuff, like the, the documents. Yeah. And great spread. Yeah. Fantastic spread, at least 200000 mm-hmm. right? But because there's so many little complicated issues in it, yeah. 
probate's going to be really expensive mm-hmm. to do. But people aren't thinking through that solution mindset of, wait a second, mm-hmm. that's peanuts compared to the whole pie, right? Right? There's so much more to it than mm-hmm. than just the probate, you know, and, right. and all of that stuff. There's there's a bigger deal at play. Yeah. And who knows? They could rezone it. There's so many options oh, with it. Oh, my God. Again, exit strategies are unlimited. Right. So sometimes it's mindset. Sometimes it's just that they're new. And they yeah. just, they don't, they, they, they're not able to think through that first hurdle of how do I get past this, right? How do I figure out, okay, what can we do, right? right. They just don't ask that question. Yeah. Okay, what can, like, and I'll tell you, every entrepreneur, you and your business, maybe you had this, I could tell you in mine, like everybody sees you on Instagram, like the Lambos, the Rolexes, like everything is awesome. No, everybody has a bad day. And you've got to really embrace that mentality of, okay, Today we took it in the ass. <laughs> Today was not a great day, right? Whatever happened, like everybody has bad days. Okay, we're coming in tomorrow. Like it's a new day. Like, you know, we've had bad deals where um, the worst one, we lost a, like a $70,000 deal like 10 minutes before closing. This would, this deal was going to be amazing. And we didn't close it at the title company where we wanted to. We let the buyer pick the title company. The buyer runs into the seller in the parking lot. And all of a sudden, now there's a bunch of objections and we're not going to close. And we knew exactly what it was. We should have been there. We didn't, weren't there. And we had like a $70,000 deal just fall apart wow. 10 minutes before closing. That's a bad day. I'm going to tell you that's a bad afternoon. Everybody in our company was like, a lot of long faces that day. Especially mm-hmm. the poor acquisitions guy who was going to make a oh lot my of gosh, money. A of lot course. of money. It was literally, this guy worked for Pepsi in our town and uh, his name was Mike, and he was literally going to use this check to quit Pepsi and come to work full time as a real estate, you know, acquisitions manager for us. And ten minutes before closing, the deal died. So those things happen, but you don't come in tomorrow and think about it, right? Yeah. Okay, we're over it. What are we going to learn from it, right? So, so we talked about that earlier. Not every deal is going to be great, right? Not every deal is going to be easy. Some will. You're going to learn jack shit on the easy deals. I'm here to tell you. The deal that you made 50000 on, that you put it on the website, it sold quick, bing, bang, boom, closed, no problem. Like, it's awesome. Like, ring the bell. Hit the gong. Yeah. Do all the things. Celebrate it. Like, get some champagne. It's awesome. It's a win. I'm not saying don't celebrate it, but you did, probably didn't learn anything from it. Yeah. The deals you learn from are the ones that go sideways or that go bad. Yeah. Right? But- okay. Like, we do that in our company. We will sit down and say, okay. What happened with this contract? Right. Did, where, was this a marketing issue? Was it an operational issue? Was it an acquisitions issue? Was it a dispo issue? Like, why did this deal not happen, right? And it could it could have been on any of those things, right? Maybe it's a deal in a town of 500 people, right? So acquisitions like, hey, I got it at the right number. Um, dispo's like, hey, I called all the people. There was just nobody to sell it to. But then that was a marketing issue, right? Mm. So lots of places where... I don't want to say the blame can be, but where we can look to your company or to my company, how we do it in our company is, you know, where, where did this, where did the flaw happen? Where did the, you know, where did things break? Yeah. Right, and so. finding out where that is and yeah. overcoming that. And then for we next learn time. from it and then we don't do it again. Right. Now, if we do it again, now we have a problem. Now right. we're having a different conversation. Yeah. And, and you're able to take that experience and explain mm-hmm. it to all the other people that you're yeah. working with or partnering with, yeah. however it is. Right. Um, two things that we have to definitely cover while, sure. while we're still in that messy yeah, yeah. title world, uh, memorandums and quiet title. Oh, okay. So I love it. So when there's like nine stories. It's not going to be quick. No, it's, it's <laughs> the quiet title's never quick, right? No, no. Um, I love it when I'm at a conference with David and I'm standing there talking about probate and all of a sudden David goes, Ooh, Ooh, I got a question got for you. I got a great one. Yeah. That's how, that's yeah. exactly how he does it. Yeah. Um, what is quiet title? Yeah. And he just passes me the mic. And I'm thinking, David, like, you know, this is the long, you're going to get the lawyer explanation. You're going to get the newspaper explanation. (laughs) With me, it's like such a caveman explanation, right? And it's like, it's one of those topics that like, you really have to know what it is. You have to know, um, um, the, the, the amount of time it's going to take, what goes into it. A lot of, a lot of times I'll get calls from investors that'll say, Hey, Al, um, uh, we got a situation and yeah. it's going to need quiet title. Mm-hmm. Um, and I have my whole spiel that's been refined over um, experiences. Yeah. Um, but you say, but does it? And why do you think that? Right? Yeah, or, or is there a way that we don't have to do that? Yes. Like, is there other oh, solutions? That's, that's not a needle to the eye. 
What are some things that you can explain to the wholesalers, to the investors, to even agents that may come across that kind of stuff? Because I know there was a story that you were, you know, going to talk about so, too with the rehab. There is a story. Yeah. Right. So there's a reason why I know a lot about quiet title. Would you like to hear it? Oh, we got to hear about <laughs> it. I mean, I've got to hear I about it. I don't want to hear the lawyer response. No, you know? no. So, so here's the story. <laughs> well, we set the mood, make so, it all nice. Yeah. So, um, so we're in Chattanooga. Um, and let me just say this. So we're wholesaling, right? We're, we're wholesaling like crazy. Um, we really found our niche. We're buying properties. We're figuring out owner financing. And the market's changing a little bit. So we're like, let's do a couple rehabs. Let's, let's do some stuff. So we did our first rehab. It was just a disaster, different story. So this other property comes up. And um, kind of a goofy seller. Like he had some, some issues, like he couldn't leave the house and couldn't be within 2,000 yards of a school, kind of, you know, it's some issues, right? And this was, anyways, this was where he lived. So um, we wanted to buy the house and it was like 35,000 or something. And um, I said, okay, let's just close on it. We've got the money from a private lender. We'll close on it and then we'll just figure it out. We'll resell it or we'll rehab it. We'll do something with it, right? Um, we'll rehab it, right? Because we just did this other rehab. So we close on it. And like two days after we close, I get a call from this realtor because the seller had been trying to sell it with a realtor and, you know, he got a postcard from us and that's how he called us. But anyways, so realtor calls and she's like, hey, my two investors, they wanted to buy this house. They're, they put in an offer of 58,000, but I guess you bought it first. Um, do you want to sell it? I'm like, well, absolutely. 35, 50, two days, right? Like, it's good. She's like, okay, um, you know, let me send you a contract. We'll, we'll get title work started. I'm like, okay, perfect. So like a week, week and a half later, two weeks later, whatever it was, she calls and like, oh, like we can't close on this. Like, what do you mean? Oh, somebody filed a notice or a memo on the property and, oh, no, 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 you're mistaken. I have clear title. We're good. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, maybe you want to call this title company that we're using. So I call them and they're like, sure enough, there was this memo that was recorded. I'm like, can you send it to me? Can like, this was my first time mm -hmm. through this, right? I'm like, send me what we've got here. So I look at it and it's a notice of contract. And I look at the signature, I'm like, I know this guy. I don't know him well. We're not like buddies, but I know who it is. Chattanooga is not that big of a town. So I call him up. Let's call this guy Bob as well to like not name check him. I'm like, hey, Bob, hey, this house over 129 uh, North Moore, which is the address of the house if anybody wants to look it up. Uh, 129 North Moore Street in Chattanooga, Tennessee, little yellow house. I'm like, hey man, um, hey, so I bought this house over on Moore and I'm getting ready to resell it, but it looks like you've got a cloud on the title or a notice, a memo. I came in, can you just come down and, and sign a release for that so I can get this thing sold? And he's like, no. Mm. I'm like- Like right away, just like, oh, just yeah, like yeah. straight yeah. up. Oh yeah, straight no. I'm like, well, yeah, I need to sell it. And you know, we closed on it, so I need you to sell it or to, to sign this thing. No, what are you selling it for? I'm like, doesn't matter what I'm selling it for. And uh, like, even when I was new, I wasn't an idiot, right? So I'm like, no. He says, well, um, yeah, if you'll split your deal with me, I'll, I'll release it. I'm like, absolutely not. I'm like, Bob, because I want to say his name so bad. I'm like, Bob, we're not doing that. I don't know if you think I'm fucking new. Like, we're not doing this, right? Like, I've probably wholesaled a couple hundred houses at this point. I'm like, no, we're not doing that. You need to sign this release. Nope, I'm not doing it. Not unless you'll split the deal with me. I'm like, I'm not splitting Jack and or shit with you. I'm just telling you right now. Um, he's like, well, I'm not releasing it. Click. Call my attorney. I'm like, Craig, I need you to do something here. He's like, all right, send me what you got. You know, because I'm like all fired up. You know, an attorney. Like, send me what you got, man. It'll be fine, right? So he calls him up and he's like, yeah, the guy's not going to release it. I'm like, fine. Offer him two grand or something just to, to release it calls him back. He's like, nope, he's not releasing it. I'm like, well, now I'm calling my title company, right? Who closed on it the first time, who gave me title insurance. And I'm like, like, oh, I'm so sorry. We missed it. I'm like, missed it? What the fuck does that even mean, missed it? Like, how do you miss it? This yeah, is what you do. We've heard that one before. I know. I'm like, well, this is the first time for me. I'm like, this is what you do. You pay a guy to go down and do this. This is, this is your thing. And uh, like, oh, I'm really sorry. Um, you'll have to file a claim against First American or whatever. I'm like, oh, I will. You know, I thought this was going to go someplace, right? But yeah, I get this. Yeah. Fill out this pile of paperwork. Right? Yeah. So, okay. So I call my attorney. I'm like, well, what's the answer here? And uh, he's like, 
well, you're going to have to do a suit for quiet title. I'm like, I don't even know what that is. I don't need a suit. I need, you know, he's like, no, no, no. He's like, no, dummy. <laughs> so, no, we're going to have to sue for quiet title. I'm like, so how long is that going to take? Like, oh, well, probably like three to four months. Like if everything is good. If, yeah. Yeah, right, if. And I'm like, oh, well, I got these buyers. He's like, no, you don't. <laughs> he's like, why don't you see if they'll hang out? So I called the realtor. She's like, nah, my guys are out. We're going to buy something else. I'm like, shit. So now I got this house sitting there yeah. that I don't, I think I own, but I have private money on it, but I can't do anything with it because I don't know if it's really going to be mine. Like, even though I paid $35,000 plus anyways. So I'm like, all right, what do we need to do? He's like, well, so here's the way a quiet title works. And again, this is my caveman understanding of it. So as I always tell you, please clean up the gaps in my story. This is, this is David's disclaimer on quiet title. Yes. I am not an attorney. I didn't play one and <laughs> I did not stay at a holiday in last night, but um, he's like, so we're going to have to, you know, of course we'll serve, serve him because he's got a notice. We're going to post it in the newspaper because we're going to have public service, public notice. Mm -hmm. And it's going to say basically hearey, hearey, anybody who <laughs> thinks they have any claim to this property, Please show up at courtroom number three at, uh, you know, Superior Court, whatever date, and, uh, you know, let your claim be heard, right? So in quiet title, you know, anybody who has a claim to the property is supposed to show up. Now, anybody who's in the um, chain of title would also get a letter, right? Let's say, you know, there was a mortgage that was unreleased, they're going to get a letter, right? An heir, possible heir, they're going to get a letter, right? Everybody's going to get a letter who is listed in title someplace mm -hmm. who has not already been cleared, so, so this has to be posted, what, like three times or something, whatever it is, right? So it's a, it's a time-consuming process, mm -hmm. and it costs money, right? Because attorneys don't work for free. Typically. No, no, not at all. No, no. Um, so, so we get through all of this. We get through, we, it's court day. So I show up at court, and this smug dick like meets, me, meets me in the lobby and like wants to shake my hand. I'm like, no, no, we're here because of you. So we get in there whatever, however many wraps, whatever it is. So we're all standing there and the whole thing happens pretty quickly. Nobody else shows up. It's me, um, my attorney, my wife, my brother, and it's him. I don't even think, he did have an attorney. He did have an attorney. So I don't know which, which one of us spoke first. I feel like it was me. Um, our attorney gets up. He's like, you know, here's the case. Bum, 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 bum. The facts are very clear, you know. Uh, you know, Mr. Oles, CHP Investments, they bought this property. There's this cloud, title company missed it. Like, that's it. Like, there wasn't, there's not a big story, right? So they get him, Nitwit, Bob. He stands up, and uh, um, so the judges, you know, ask him a question. Hey, you, you have this cloud on there, yeah? Yeah, yes, sir, I do. Where'd you learn how to do that? Well, you know, we talked about the person earlier whose course he got it out of. So anyways, a, a reputable guy, right? Nationwide guy, old-time guy. Yeah, I, I'm, you know, I'm certified, you know, street certified or whatever, right? So uh, the judge is like, yeah. He's like, yeah, and I have equitable interest. And like, at that moment, I felt the shift in the room. The judge is like, what? Yeah, I have an equitable interest because I signed the contract. The judge is like, essentially said, you don't have shit, right? So that's one of those things that real estate investors have been running around the world for 20 years saying, if you have a contract, you have equ equitable interest. The judge is like, you had a contract. Why didn't you close? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, blah, 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 some story. He's like... Mr. Oh, I got, got close there. Mr. Bob, I want you to show me where you had the funds and you were able to close and, you know, where your title work was done. I want you to show me that you were ready to close and that you have a valid claim on this property. Well, um, you know, I, I used private lenders and I was going to get somebody and I just, just like, why didn't you close? But, 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 you know, and it's a lot of something. Mm -hmm. Done. 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 That was it. Fine. Oh, and he had to pay. He had to pay for everything. Oh, nice. What was, what was that? It's like five grand. Okay. Yeah. Take it. But problem for me is I lost my buyers. Now, now I have to go rehab this property. Right. Which there's like, there's of course, like with every story, there's five other stories that go off of that one. But uh, yeah, I mean, it cost me a couple of months of the property just sitting there. It cost me money. Like nothing I could have done to avoid it. Yeah. Right. Like we talk about going back and looking at your mistakes. It was just a thing. Right. It just happened. Um, but we didn't call, curl up in a ball and go, OK, I'll split the fee. I didn't, you know. What can I do to get past this? Right. Yeah. What are you going to do next? Yeah. It, Dum Dum should have taken the two grand, just signed the thing and just moved on. Instead of getting two, it cost him five. You know, that yeah. was a $7,000 swing.
Well, let's talk about memorandums. Yes. Right? That's a that's a it's hot the most thing. sore spot that I've got, right? Yeah, well, people go but through I, that. But I run a company where we provide memos for people, so, you know. There you go. Easy REI Closings has those memos, so we will uh, we'll, we'll file memos. Um again, not every not every municipality files the same. Not everybody you can e-file. Some people you have to file in person. Some people yeah. need a Notice of contract. Some people want a memorandum. Some yeah. want, they, there are a lot of different. There's a that's just a cat's nest of yeah. issues in there. Um, but we call them memos or notice of contracts. It's kind of like Kleenex, right? It's just yeah. a generic term. Yeah, I, I refer to them as memos, yeah. right? You know, it's yeah. like for death certificate DC. You yeah. Know? But if I told that to you, you'd be like, "What is that?" Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. But like memorandum lawyer term. That I got, I, you it's know, just because I'm so smart. Just an abbreviation, <laughs> right? Um, memorandums play yeah. a role in a transaction, right? So they yes. come up innovations because that's that's the yep. way to secure your interest in mm-hmm. that transaction. They come up when you're. A, a potential buyer and you want to mm-hmm. make sure, hey, if this yep. seller backs out, uh, what are some tips and tricks and things that... So let's first talk about what a memo is because I don't, okay, I don't know good. that people always understand. Here's the way it was explained to me. We've all seen Little House on the Prairie. There you go. Right? Little House on the Prairie, literally the schoolyard, the cranky girl that has the convenience store, whatever it is, right? But there's one there's one tree in the middle, in the middle of... What is it? Oh, no, what was the, what was the, what was the town for Little House on the Prairie? Ing, no, Ingalls. Ah, something Grove, Walnut Grove. Okay, there oh, we go. Oh God, when you're 51, pulling those out is hard, right? <laughs> it's not like Harry Potter where you're just pulling out the little. You the went into the library for that. God, one. I had to go deep for that. So, anyways, also, did you know Michael? Do you ever watch? Um, um, oh God, what's the what's the the movie that everybody uh, or the show uh, Yellowstone? Uh-huh. Do you watch Yellowstone? I, I saw season one and season two. So there's this girl, this real skinny girl that kind of talks with, like she's always got chew in her mouth and her t- a tweeter is her name or something. Anyway, she's Michael Landon's daughter. Boy, how do you, that's like connecting like the six, six people that know Will, Will Smith, right? Or something. But anyways, so <laughs> Little House on the Prairie, the little tree. Um, there was no public record in the early days, right? In the wild, wild west, people literally would take a notice and go tack it to whatever the board was, Mm -hmm. and this was public notice, right? So, deeds, Joe owes me money, this guy owes the convenience store money, whatever, right? The the trading post, you know, Bob bought, you know, Joe's cattle, whatever it was, people would go literally tack a notice someplace, and this was the early public notices, right? So, say all of that to get us to here. So, all a memo is, or a memorandum, or affidavit, or all of these things is it's public notice, right, that says, I have some interest in 123 Main Street. That's it. That's all a notice is. It's not magic. It doesn't force people to do anything. It simply sits out there as notice that you or me or whoever filed it has some interest in the property. It doesn't say, necessarily say what your interest is. It doesn't have to. It probably should. <laughs> but, mm-hmm. but the way real estate investors, it's just a thing. This is why we call it a cloud because it sort of hangs over the property, right? Mm-hmm. So... What's supposed to happen is your title company is supposed to do a title search and it pops up and then you go, oh, it's like a stop sign. We can't clear this title. We can't give, you know, your client or your end buyer, you know, clear, uh, you know, clear. Oh boy, it's late. So my mind's starting to go clear and equitable or what? what's the term? The ti- It can't get clear title, mm-hmm. right? Because this has to be cleared up first. So. That's all a memo is, is it just sits out there on public record. Hopefully the title company catches it and it says, hey, we need to resolve this, whatever this is. Yeah. Before we can proceed to closing. Yeah. And it, it, a lot of people have heard of it. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, I don't think some have actually seen it in play. A lot of the seasoned investors, I know the ones in Jacksonville, mm-hmm. um, immediately they lock the property up under contract yeah. and they're already recording the memo yeah. right away because you know how some sellers can be. Sure. Um, there's I'm going to go to David. I'm going to go to uh, Ricardo. I'm going to go yeah, to this one, and, you know, yeah, and yeah. Uh, this one's got a better offer. There, well, wait a second. You're under contract. Yeah. Well, and there, I think there are a lot of things that cause that to happen. Um, I would say most of the time that's the investor's fault. Again, yeah, like that's a side tra- trail that we can go down and certainly talk about. Um, but a lot of people see it online or they hear the idea of a memo and they get very arrogant and cocky, especially the last couple of years. Like, oh, I'm going to put a memo on that. I'm going to cloud that, that title. I'm going to do all these things. And they don't understand necessarily what it does or, you know, that it's not going to, it's not the end all be all. I can cloud a title all day long 
and you can buy it from the seller, you can work right around that that cloud. Mm-hmm, it's not a big mm-hmm, deal, mm-hmm. right? You can buy it for cash and say, I don't need a title search. I don't want to talk. Or I'll, I'll take the title search, but I don't need a policy. Yeah. I don't care, right? I'm going to, you know, I'm going to, I'm just going to close on it. I'm going to close around it or I'm going to close it as an exception on my policy and go get, go pound sand. Yeah. All right. I'm not going to honor that. Now, down the road, is it going to be an issue that you might have to clear it? If you want to sell it to somebody who has to have clear title, in the case of a novation, why they work so good is because the person who's buying it is getting a bank loan. A bank, Bank of America, Chase, Citibank is not funding on a property that does not have perfect or clear title because that property is the collateral against the loan, right? So they don't want Penelope, the third, third cousin twice removed, to be able to come back later and go, hey, this is really my property. I'm snatching it because what would happen is it would wipe out their first position lien. Mm. Yeah. Am I doing okay so far? Well, I think just the, the concept of it, I mean, yeah. and you how, how you were talking about, hey, if we go down this little rabbit hole yes. with how, whose fault is it mm-hmm. with memorandums? You were mentioning that. He said that yeah. when it comes to memorandums, like, so. <laughs> rewind the tape. Yeah, re- rewind, rewind the, the tape, tape what, right? We'll, what was we'll I saying? Because again. again, you know, this is what happens when you, when you get old and have too much stuff jammed into your brain. I really don't remember what that was. I know I just said it. But all in all, memorandums, yeah. they, can, they can be pretty vital to a deal. Sure. Um, they can all, you, you know, it's kind of gray too. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, some people use them like they shouldn't, right? Um, so there are times when you, when I would put memos on a property, right? So if I am, uh, if I've got a contract where the seller maybe lives there and I know that I'm going to have buyers over there, do I want to put a memo on there? Um, just to make sure somebody doesn't try to go around me. Right. I may do that because that's happened to me and that's going to happen to everybody as a wholesaler. Right. There are just going to be deals where things happen. It's not the end of the world. It sucks. Maybe you lost an assignment fee. But Mm -hmm. anyways, life goes on. So, um, you know, there are times where you may may want to do a memo. Maybe you're two weeks into your deal and all of a sudden your seller starts getting sketchy and won't return your calls. We'll immediately put a memo on the property. Luckily for us, we have a whole office full of people that know how to do it and can can really do it almost instantly. But um, yes, so all uh, all that we are doing by putting a memo on it, we say, you know, put a memo on it, is I'm going to make sure that somebody can't go around me and get title insurance without calling me first. That's really all that it does. It's right. just a stop sign. It's a speed bump. Yeah. Can people go around it? Yes. And this is where I was talking about where people um, the last couple of years have gotten a little arrogant, like, oh, I'm going to put a memo on them and screw them. Well, one, if they don't sell, it doesn't matter because mm-hmm. they don't it's never going to come up. And two, like I can just, if I wanted to, I would just close right around you because I have cash. You know, I don't need to clear your memo off of there. So um, are they the end all be all? No. You know, do you, should you have a legitimate contract that's still in effect and you know, you've done everything you can do and you legitimately have the ability to close and the funds to close. And it's just the seller who maybe has changed their mind after the fact, you know, would I say file it? Yes. Yeah. But like have the intention of doing it. Don't just file it just to want to screw somebody. Right. right? Yeah. Like that's not right. That's not good. Yeah. Like sometimes every so often, because we have so many clients, we'll, you know, maybe have a younger client, you know, a newer wholesaler that's that's hasn't been around that long. And, you know, their contract will almost be expired. There'll be like three days left and they'll be like, Yeah, like I just uh, you know, the seller was being a pain in the ass. Just can you just want to put a memo on the property? I'm like, Did you have three days left on your contract? Are you going to close? Well, no, I'm still looking for a buyer. Don't put a memo on the property. That's not the right thing. Yeah. Like you, you don't have the ability to close. You don't have the intention of closing. Like we could talk all day about wholesaling and transparency and all that. Like you're not going to close. Like we'll do it if you want to pay, but I'm telling you like, it's not the right thing to do. Yeah. You know, but if you call me like the day after your contract's expired, our policy is absolutely not. Yeah. There's, I, I mean, there's so, I want to be involved in that. so many things to go through when it comes yeah. to all that. Yeah. I mean, you got to really know what you're doing. Mm-hmm. You got to know who the players are. Yeah. You got to know what kind of people you're dealing mm-hmm. with on the seller end. Yeah. Um, and if, if it's a deal that you, it's worth fighting for yeah. if that all goes down. Right. Um, because here's what's going to happen. Say that thought is you file a notice, right? Because you did want to close on it. You did have a buyer that was ready to close. And, you know, let's say it's in Alabama someplace. And, uh, you know, you've contracted the property and a couple of weeks after you contracted it, you know, some realtor comes along and says, Hey, I can get you more. Mm-hmm. Well, 
you signed you signed a contract, right? You signed a contract for 160, 170. Now the realtor's telling you you can get 200. Well, I get that. I understand, but we have a contract. Our con- it is a valid contract and we want to close on it. Right? Yeah. This is why this is why we have contracts, right? Because people don't people aren't people of their word, unfortunately, right? So, um, we've got a contract to purchase it at this amount. Hey, we want to close. Well, we don't want to close. We want you to release release the the cloud. And we're going through this very situation right this minute in, um, in Alabama. And I'm like, well, no, we have a contract. We agreed to purchase it. You wanted us to purchase it. You called us. You had an issue. We solved your issue. We're going to close. We want to close. We have a buyer. We'll close it ourselves. Well, no, um, we're going we're, we're gonna, to, you know, we just changed our mind. But the truth is we can see on Zillow that it went pending and that it's, you know. Yeah. So we know, we know what the story is. And you know, then you have to decide you want to stick to your guns or not? Yeah. So, you know, after a bunch of calls, hey, will you release this? No, I'm sorry, we can't. We're ready. What day would you like to close? We're ready to close any day that you want. Title work is literally done. We can show you we've got proof of title. We have all of the things that we didn't have in those other other times. Well, we're just, we're, we've are we're just changed our mind. I'm like, well, you can't change your mind. We've, we have a contract. Yeah. We do. And I usually will explain to people, if I was to back out of our contract at the last minute to you, would you be upset? Well, and they'll try to say no, but I'm well, you would. The truth is you would, right? Would. Because we agreed to do something, right? And so anyways, so now we're in a position where, you know, the attorney calls me. I'm like, he's like, oh, you don't have a valid contract. I'm like, oh, I think that we do. I think my contract's been challenged in court, and I think that we do. And I'm not an attorney, but I've done a lot of this. And right? I've been doing this for a long time. Not an attorney. Not an attorney. But... <laughs> Clarifying. Just, just to be sure, not an attorney. But I've had a lot of title agents and attorneys call me and ask me questions, right? So, because um, we, you know, we're, we're like Allstate, we've seen a thing or two. Mm-hmm. And uh, so he's like, yeah, and your cloud's no good. I'm like, oh, it's not? Oh, we'll just close on it then. And then what happens? Yep. Silence. You know, I'm like, well, just if my cloud's no, you know, my memo's no good, just close on it. And I know that they can't because I know that they're obviously selling to somebody who's getting a bank. You know, I, you know, you never ask a question you don't know the answer to, yeah. right? I'm sure they taught you that in law oh, school, yeah. right? So um, I'm like, okay, we'll close on it. Well, you got to release it. I'm like, well, we're not going to release it, but we are happy to close. What day? I always end it. What day would you like to close? Please ask your clients what day you'd like to close. We'll make sure that the title work is updated and we update the search and we'll be happy to close. So then I got certified letter. You gotta, you know. Legal stuff, lawyer stuff, right? So I spent a lot of time having some paralegal type this up and send it to me certified. So honestly, I looked at it. I came back from a trip or something and there's certified mail on my desk. I'm like, oh, what could this be? Page, page, page. Like I didn't read any of it. I'm like, oh, okay, yeah. I sort of set it down and then uh, uh, I got an email from the same guy, the same attorney. Yeah, we, we sent you certified mail. I'm like, oh yeah, yeah, I got that. That's what I just, I replied. Yeah, yeah, I got that. <laughs> so he emails me back and I can tell he's getting mad well, you know, you need to release and, you know, all this stuff. And I'm like, just ask your client what day they'd like to close. You know, we're ready to close. Also, our contract is enforceable. It's been tested. Our cloud, you know, the memo is good. Please, what day would you like to close? Yeah. So then he emails back something like, um, you know, something, something, you know, veiled threat or something. I'm like, y'all, like, we're going to sue you. I'm like, oh, okay. 5312 Ring Gold Road. You've already, you've already sent me certified mail, so you have my address. Just file it, man. Like, file it. It's good, man. I, we're ready to close. We have the money. We have a buyer. Like, all the things, we're ready to close. So, and uh, they said, well, you should have your attorney. Uh, or that's what I said. I'm like, file it. We'll be down there with our attorney. Just let us know what day. Happy to show up, man. Mm. Um, yeah, we'll have your attorney call me. I'm like, nope. Not going to add a bunch of billable hours. File it. We'll see you there. And just like that. And that was it. So it took about three weeks and we, he did, they did file it. So oh, okay. that's where we're at now. Yeah, they filed it. Um, you know, you're, you're all, all the things, right? Yeah. You know, but uh, you know, it's, it's a whole filing of legal stuff. So I sent it to my guy, Jason. He's like, yeah, I'll call him. I'm like, dude, tell him we'll release for 20 grand. Like, like we, had a, we are ready to purchase. If you don't want to sell to us, you want to sell to them, that's fine. This is what the cost release is. Or... We will be happy to close on the day of your choice. Yeah, I mean either, either or, right? You give them. Yeah. Put the options out there. Yeah, like which do which? This is a choose your own adventure. You get to pick. Yeah. 
Well, I tell you, David, one, one thing's for sure, that if you get into this world, uh, whether it's by yourself or you mm-hmm. bring on somebody, if that's yeah. an option too, is you really got to know who you're dealing with. You yeah. got to you gotta really understand the the game of what's happening way yeah. ahead of time because you don't you don't want to start just doing all these things and not knowing about uh, yeah. options that are out there or yeah. crazy messy deals and who the specialists are right yeah. but what happens in real estate is people will say hey we want to buy this deal we want to we want to take on this multifamily project right mm-hmm. But we don't have the capital for it. Yeah. Um, maybe we need to bring on a partner or somebody to come on that'll help fund the project, mm-hmm. maybe do some back end stuff, mm-hmm. you know. And that plays a role too in finding partnerships, right? Yeah. Partnerships is a topic that I mean, I, I talked about it with Corey. I think it was Corey or uh, I had another guest on that talked mm-hmm. about it. But partnerships it's not an easy word, no. right? You you have people that say, hey, let's partner up. Let's do this together, you know? No, 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 no. It's not let's JV on a deal. Partner is split in the pot. It's like getting married. It, 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 without, yeah. W- without any of the good things. Right, but like <laughs> signing the paperwork, yeah. getting, it, getting into a partnership. Yeah. It's very rare and hard for partnerships to work. Almost. Right? Well, what's, uh, far, what's more, like? far more fail than... Yeah than divorces, right? Like it's it's a very high fail rate. And so I've been through a couple of them, right? And four, as a matter of fact. Um, you know, first partnership, so much to talk about here. So here's why I think people initially partner, right? Is because there's something that they think they're flawed at or not good enough at that I need to bring in this person and they're going to offset my weaknesses, right? Um, and typically that's not the case. Promise you're just better off learning. In my experience, you're far better off learning what it is you thought that you couldn't do because odds are that person can't do it anyways. But so I've, I've, I've had a few partnerships. Um, so one, when we moved to Chattanooga, um, we partnered with this, this other guy who now we're great. We're still great friends, but when we partnered with him, his name is Randy Shelley. He's a big private money lender. Hundreds and hundreds of apartment complexes. I probably should have gone gone the route he went. But here's ultimately in a partnership, right? You're you're two people, and you're you're going to go down the road, and you have to have you have to be aligned in what you want, right? Because you have to both want the same thing. You have to be you know lockstep. It's like the what is it the the potato sack race, mm-hmm. right? Where you lash one leg together to your partner, and you've got to be able to walk together, right? Because if not, you're going to start to get out of sync, right? So if you partner with somebody, um, you've got to, you have to have aligned values and vision and all of those things, right? You have to be walking together, going in the same direction. Because the minute one of you starts to to veer off and want to do something different, now you have a problem. Your visions are different. Or your your goals and what you want to do in life are different. And I'm not saying that makes one person good or one person bad. I'm not. It's just a thing, right? So I have a variety of partnerships. All of them, most of them, three out of the four have gone on to be wildly successful, right? I was partnered with my brother for a little bit. He wanted to go do something different. Now he owns this like 180-acre glamping, awesome Airbnb, cool site in Chattanooga. Plus he's got a bunch of rentals and doing fabulous, and I'm so proud of him. Um, Thomas Morgan, Thomas Morgan, REI, you guys can look him up, but so he's done this cool thing. Randy, obviously super successful, hard money lender owns apartment complexes. And like, I'm fascinated talking to him because he just went off in a different direction. But at the time in our business, that wasn't a direction that I wanted to go in. Right. Again, I tell people I'm a very simple caveman. We stay in the lines of what we're doing. This is 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 what we're doing. Like I don't vary. Right. That's one reason that we've had success. Um, another partner, that uh, that came on. He didn't initially start as a partner. His name was Justin. Justin Huggins. Probably I was best man at his wedding. One of my best friends now. Um, but they went off in a different direction, and now he owns a ton of commercial real estate. Probably is worth twice as much as I am, and he owns Key Title and Escrow in Chattanooga, which is one of the biggest investor title companies in the state. Right. So people just people change, and they just want to do something different. That's not good or bad. We want to stay on track and, you know, anyways, so yeah, you partner with people and they don't always have the same long-term vision as you, right? And that gets very difficult once you're in it to get out of it. Right. Especially if you had 
joint properties, right? You have ownership and properties in your company or LLC or corporation or whatever it is. Or financial interest. Yeah, yeah. Now you've got to figure out a way to sort that out. And, you know, I've been in a couple of those where it was challenging. And we, it was like a divorce. Like it literally was like, you know, we're emailing back and forth trying to figure out how we're splitting up properties. And that's terrible. Mm-hmm. It's no, again, it's nobody's fault. Nobody, but like stuff has to be split. You know, you're King Solomon splitting the baby, right? And for us, the best thing was, okay, you whack them in half, I'll pick which one I want, right? That's usually the easiest way. So yes, they're terrible when they happen. And for me, after my fourth one last year, I finally realized, you know, this person that I thought was going to be able to come into my business and bring all of these things didn't, for whatever reason, right? It's okay. Um, You know, I can do those things on my own. Like I can learn how to do payroll. I can learn how to go out and get a loan. I can learn how to do do the things that I thought I wasn't good enough, smart enough, or gosh darn it, people like me, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Um, Whatever it is. So, So yeah, I'm not a huge fan of partnerships. I think you know, one-off deals or something like that is fine. But, you know, be careful partnering up with people. And I see this so often, right? We've, the term, you know, there's some guys that, that coined the term squad up, right? And we see it, you know, mm-hmm. all over. And I see it so often with one newbie wanting to squad up with another newbie. And neither mm-hmm. one of them know anything about anything. But they want to do it they together. They want to do it together. But do they, it. do they really need to do it together? Yeah. Like, <sighs> You know, you have one person who doesn't know what the other, you know, neither one know anything, but they're out there trying to do something. And is that effective, right? I would say if you're going to squat, like, go find somebody that knows what's going on and work with that person. Yeah, it's very difficult to find people to partner with. It's it's challenging. You have to find, you have to find people that will focus on the things that you don't want to do. One, two, that have strengths in your weakness. Right. Uh, three that want to really find that same vision mm-hmm. together. I mean, like you said, mm-hmm. it can go like this for so long and all of a sudden it just does yeah. this or both do that. Yeah. Right? Like I, I, I was talking to somebody the other day, like, um, or yes, this morning the, the person I was talking to, um, him and his partner, they actually owned a wholesaling business and a coaching business. And luckily for them, they had two entities. They could just split it right in half. One took one, one took the other. And that worked out okay, but sometimes you have just this collage of stuff and maybe you had it for four, five, six, seven years and now you've got to split it up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you, I mean, it's you wanna, rough. You want to lose six months of your life? That's how you do it. Yeah, it's yeah. rough. So w- you would say no to partnerships. If you could, it depends on the situation, right? Uh, for me, I'm always like, I will, yeah. for me, <laughs> for my situation. Disclaimer on partnerships. It's just disclaimer on partnerships because I've been through four and finally I got tired of, poking myself in the eye yeah. with a fork. And I just realized, um, what do they say? What's the book? Like hire your weakness or no, uh, who not how, right? You can hire mm-hmm. somebody who is amazing. And, you know, I've got some people in my companies who are almost like partners. There is as close to being a partner without being named partner, partner. as they can be. Right. Um, because they're so valuable to me. And, you know, I probably pay them better than my partner would have gotten paid if, if we had partnered. Yeah. But essentially, at the end of the day, it's me and it's my decision and I have to do that. But could I do it without having a great team? Absolutely not. Right. Mm-hmm. There's, you know, without Heather and Narissa and oh. you know, Hannah and Shelly and, you know, Olivia, and, you know, the team that I've got is just just amazing. Um, yeah, and they allow me to be gone for a week to you know to come down here and do this kind of stuff. Yeah. Well, Heather's got the whole team going she and Hannah's awesome. got everything going. Oh right. yeah. The whole team's been, we'll, we'll talk about that yeah. whole side of it, right? Easy REI closings and the team that you've put together and mm-hmm. built. Cause that's a whole thing too. It's, I, it's a thing, right? Huge. Yeah. Um, so we'll get into that. Uh, one thing I will say, and, and this will tie into it, which is, your growth and, and scaling your business, mm-hmm. right? So yeah. let's let's talk about easy REI closings okay. and and the growth and trajectory of where you've gone, right? You've, yeah. You you social media has played a role also in it's where weirdest, things have headed. It's the weirdest thing. It's, it's social media is the weirdest thing. Pe- <laughs> people are paying attention though. People are watching, yeah. right? Tell us about that it's growth. Comfortable, but yeah, it, yeah. it can be that way. It's a very yes, yes. Being even the littlest bit social media famous or Instagram famous is a very, and I'm not obviously, you know, on any kind of level, but 
now there are events where we go to and people come up and they want to talk to you. And it, as an introverted person who's very like, like I'm just as happy sitting in my office by myself with the door closed, just working away. Right. I, I don't. Yes. Anyways. Yeah. It's, it's a strange thing. I'll just, I'll just say that. It's sometimes weird. I'm like, like, yeah, I watched your videos. I'm like, oh, you're the one. And they laugh and I laugh. The toaster laughs. But um, the, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's weird. Like I, you could see me visually getting uncomfortable about it. Right. Like it's, it's, a, it's a weird <laughs> this is thing. A taste, a test uh, study right now. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Like, like, yeah, the camera's like going off the charts. Like, it, it, <laughs> yeah, I'm right. squir- I haven't squirmed all day. And, and, and the social media thing makes me squirm. Social media, social media. Yeah, dude. But, yeah. but like, tell us about the growth part of it. Right. Sure. So you, you started, you got easy REI closings together. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, you really branched it to be this nationwide, yeah. this dispo center, a closing mm-hmm. company, everything. Yeah nationwide putting a team together building an entire team Mm -hmm. right putting the right pieces in place right Mm -hmm. finding a heather right finding an a hannah that can Mm -hmm. do those things on the transaction side those are that those are hard decisions and and i mean easy decisions to find them and and say let's let's go but hard to find those pieces that are going to work and churn so you can sit here in the studio while mm-hmm. the whole team's churning out deals and getting things done, yeah. what the, what's all of that been like? While at the same time being yeah. a social media star, yeah, okay. it's crazy. Well, we have to separate those. <laughs> There's a those lot are, of things. Those are definitely on. two different things. So, um, okay, a lot to unpack there. Um, so here's what I want to tell people: is you know sometimes you'll well maybe we won't separate them. You know you you see people on Instagram who are legitimate because there's a lot of bullshitters out there, but <laughs> people who you know legitimately have big companies, right? Um, you know Ryan Stuman posted this thing yesterday or today, which Ryan's Ryan's amazing um, personal growth guy. But you know nothing is overnight. Like today it looks like oh you have this amazing company. How did it? It must have just been all so great and easy. But like the pyramids are literally built one block at a time, Mm -hmm. right? And sometimes when you're growing your business, like in 2009, when we started wholesaling, you know, I had no idea we'd be here, right? Like this was never the plan. This wasn't the plan at all. Um, You know, speaking of that, one thing I've got this repository, I like, because I keep everything. We were talking about that Mm -hmm. earlier. And I love whiteboards so much so that Heather in my office bought me a vibe board because I couldn't, I wasn't allowed to buy any more whiteboards. We moved to this new office. I was born buying four by whiteboards, two in a box. Like they're everywhere in my office. And, uh, but they told the girls told me no more whiteboards because I love mm-hmm. writing on them. Right. Which is weird because I hated going up to the board in high school and having to write on the board. But anyways, so I love whiteboards and, and mapping things out. Right. My brain, that's the way my brain works. It's very left to right. So you know, start here, you know, box arrow box. Right. So, the reason I say that is because over time, when we've decided to scale, we've mapped out what we thought our company was going to be. And from the very first time of, oh, we're going to go virtual, we're going to do all these things, like we had this vision of how it was going to work. And we have board after board after board after board after board of how it's changed and modified, right? So it's, it's even as simple as saying at the end of your day, you never knew how, you know, nobody knows how our day is going to end, right? I didn't know this morning that would you know, we'd be sitting here this late at night going, going this long, you know, going to be your yeah, longest you podcast ever. Yeah, well, did. I might have actually, I yeah. but there, I also didn't know that before I came here, I was in a scramble going to have to move from one hotel room to the other yeah, because yeah, my yeah. air wasn't working. Yeah. Right. So there are things that come up during your day and during, during the life of your business that, you know, you never end where you, where you think you're going mm-hmm. to end. It just doesn't mm-hmm. happen. Right. So um, as an investor, as an entrepreneur, we're starting these businesses and then, you know, things happen, things shift, right? Mm-hmm. Oh my God, I'm really great at subject two. Oh my gosh, I'm really great at negotiating short sales, right? I didn't know that this was where, where things were going to take me. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there's sometimes there's that road that can be a little, little messy sometimes. But again, so I didn't know that we'd be here, obviously in 2009. The last thing that I ever thought I'd be comfortable with would be getting on camera and talking to thousands of people who are watching your podcast, right? Um, so life happens, life changes. So anyways, so to answer your question, um, how did we do it? Well, like we solved one little problem at a time, right? So the way that like a Heather comes to work for us is, you know, we're scaling up our company and <clears throat> let me rewind the tape even more. So here's how, here's how we start as entrepreneurs, all of us, right? It's us. 
it's you, it's your one man show, your one man show, right? And then you realize, oh, if I hire somebody to do whatever this is in my business, that's one less thing I can do, I have to do, and I can focus on whatever it is that I'd like to do. Whatever, cool. So, you know, we're, we're growing, we're growing, growing, and we pop, and now there's a second person, right? This was how we started in our company. I had a partner, he was handling acquisitions, and I was doing the dispo. I was doing the dispo, the marketing, the transactions. I was doing all the stuff. Then I hired a tailor. Tailor's amazing. She's, you know, wants to learn and grow and grow and grow. And so I'm slowly clutching and breaking some of my responsibilities onto her until we get her maxed out. And then now we hire actually two more people underneath her. She trains them, mm. right? So, you know, scaling comes from a need. Okay, we are going to scale up. I need some people. Now that person is maxed out. Now we had two more. And we just, we just keep adding and adding and adding. Um, should everybody scale? I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. Scaling is not the end all be all. You, I tell people you will make less your first year or two of scaling than you would have by yourself because there's investment time and people and payroll and computers and software, right? There's all the things that you have to invest in in your company if you were going to hire another lawyer or another paralegal, right? There's an investment. There's learning curve. There's ramp up. There's so many things, yeah. right? Again, a whole nother podcast we can yeah, do on scaling. Yeah. But... Um, so how do these things happen? So we're scaling up and I'm like, listen, closer to the mic. So, okay. So I was told before we started this podcast to talk, <laughs> project into the mic. We want right? to make sure everybody can hear That's everything right. David said. That's right. So if you're in your car, oh, was it, have you ever seen Private Parts with Howard Stern? <laughs> no, all right. Too much for some of you people. Yeah, right? Ah, oh, I love Stern. So anyways, so... Um, so our company, <laughs> we're so off track. Um, that's probably like ADD, right? It probably should have been diagnosed for be. something, yeah. right? But anyway, so we're, we're growing our company. I don't have time to do all the transactions um, dealing with title companies. So we're interviewing. We had a TC. She got sick. We're hiring for somebody else. So um, I love to tell the, the story to Heather. So she comes in and literally I'm like, this woman looks like an assassin. She's like not smiling, not like nothing, right? Like, and, and, and I've told her this before. We were talking about it a couple of weeks ago. And she's like, oh, the other two people I was interviewing with, this one girl never shut up. It's like, I was so aggravated. I'm like, I don't know if I should hire this woman or be afraid. Like, I don't know. But turns out it, she was obviously the right hire. She, you know, we, we brought her in to, uh, to handle our transactions. And funny thing, my partner at the time did say to me like, oh, that, that girl's going to run our company one day. Well. He's gone and she's here and she's, she's <laughs> literally, she's my vice president of operations. She's, you know, she's worked her way all the way to the top of our company and is absolutely invaluable to me. So I know she'll be cutting that little clip right out of this. Oh yeah. We'll make a nice yeah. micro content for Heather, <laughs> right? Cause that's, that's huge. Yeah. And she'll just put on replay. But so you ask, how does it happen? You know, we had a need. We went out and hired somebody. The first person we hired wasn't the right person. The second person we, we hired was turned out to be perfect. I didn't know for sure that she was going to be great. We took a chance on her. Um, luckily, she's someone that shared our vision mm -hmm. and where we wanted to take the company. And, you know, she was very invested in what we were doing, right? Her, that's, I could say the same thing for Narissa, who's our director of marketing. Um, you know, we have Hannah, who's one of our team leaders in EZREI closing, EZRI closings. Can't get my own company right. But, uh, <laughs> you know, the thing that makes you successful is surrounding yourself with people who share your vision. Right. But how does it happen? One person at a time. There's no, you know, I think if you set out, to, I'm going to build Amazon. Right. Like, where would you even start? Mm -hmm. Right. I don't know that that's the best way to approach building, building anything. So for us, it started with Heather. Right. Easy RI closings literally goes back to that day wow. where we sat at 3335 Ringgold Road in Suite 101 and we interviewed her. And um, I, again, I was, she looked a little bit mean and uh, kind of scary and she made me a little nervous, but it, you know, it was just that she was so aggravated with this girl that we were doing joint interviews with, but we brought her in and she did a great job and she was very good and very fast and could solve problems and wanted to do more. So, you know, that you, you take those people that are invested in you and you invest your time back into them and teach them more. Right. So she yeah. came to us from a, a background. She worked at Amazon and she was an agent. And, uh, but she didn't know anything about our world, right? So, you know, you see those people in your organization or your company, those people that are there and they, they want to learn, they want to do big things, right? They want to do things bigger than what they've done before. And, um, yeah, you, you invest in them, right? So, um, so that's 
that's how it happens. You find those people. You're going to hire a lot of people, right? There are a lot of people who will come and go in, in your company. And that used to bother me a lot, a lot. That we'd hire people, they wouldn't work out. And I would take it very personal. I'm like, oh, we lost another person. What happened? Well, I don't know if you know Steve Richards. He's in family as yeah. well. Yeah. So Steve, you know, he does um, team architects and does a lot of consulting. And we hired him. And I remember being on a Zoom with him one time, not that long ago. And he said... Um, he, he, and I won't get the, the stats right here, but he said, listen, there was a study of Fortune 500 companies. And, you know, what they found was the average employee at a Fortune 500 company lasts 18 months. He's like, so listen, those are the best companies in America. I'm not saying you're not great. We're not saying that. But the best companies, the Gillettes, the, you know, you know, Owens Corning, right? Like all the biggest companies in the world, they only average 18 months. And they're literally hired by the best HR people that the mm. world has to offer. And they only last 18 months. Mm. He's like, dude, you're on a wholesaling business. Relax. Like people are going to say, stay eight to 10 months, 12 months. That's just a reality of just what our business is and what our culture has become. And people are very transient and they're always looking for another opportunity. So when you find those people, the Heather, the Narissa's, the Hannah's, right? People that, you know, again, want to be on this journey with you to help you grow, you know, you have to kind of invest in them and feed into them and, you know, help, you know, they, they're people who want to grow and learn some more stuff and take on responsibility. And it's, I think it's your job as, as the owner, like that's your only job, right? Is to help your people to grow and get what they want. Yeah. It's uh, it's definitely a journey to find the right person. It, oh, it is. And it's hard too, because if you look, look, for example, like you find one person, you're like, okay, this person's probably a good fit. And you work with them for six months. And then sometimes they quit. Like, or no, or yeah. it's not that they quit, or they um, they're not leveling up to the next yeah. level on the tasks, mm -hmm. right? Or you thought they were this, and then it's just not happening on yeah. on the rest, right? So, yeah. so so lucky that you found Heather early on because yeah. look what she's like at trade show. She's immediately like on the spot with mm -hmm. explaining things. Yeah. Uh, talking she to loves investors. being out at trade shows, talking to people more than anything. Ah, look at that! She loves that <laughs> stuff. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. But that, but that's somebody that yeah. you you really help figure out. Wait a second, yeah. we can mold this right, or we can really help yeah. train this. So now Heather's taking the lead mm -hmm. and really training people under her. Yeah. And now those people can then train. So then, yeah. Um, you know, and it, sometimes the, they work, sometimes they don't. You know. There are hard parts of being a business owner, right? There are going to be days when you let somebody go who's just absolutely terrible, doesn't show up on time. Like, those are the easy ones. The people that you really like, like, that are nice, good people that may believe, sometimes they believe, but they're just not the right person. Yeah. Right? Those are the hard days. Right? Yeah. I've had a few of those, a couple of them this year. And, man, there's been guys and girls that I thought the world of really liked them, but they just weren't a good fit. And I didn't have another place to put them. Yeah. You know? Is, is scaling to you like having multiple businesses ongoing and keep finding that next business or is mm -hmm. it or is it just the growth within your company? I think that the way that I look at scaling is growing each individual business, right? So we have our wholesale business, we're scaling that. We have Easy REI Closing, which will scale to be a you know, 25 or $30 million company. It will be a big company. Mm -hmm. um, and it's it's well on its way. You know, they have a coaching business that you're scaling. You can scale your rental business. I think it's, you know, it, it's being able to look at one individual business and say, okay, how do I make this? Not necessarily bigger, right? How do I make it better, right? How Okay, I want to add, you know, maybe three apartment complexes, whatever it is, mm -hmm. right? Um, mm -hmm. So I guess, you know, there is some, some making it bigger. Um, but there's got to be efficiencies in there, right? We don't want to just be adding bad clients and easy that are going to cost us money, right? We don't want to be um, doing bad wholesale deals where, you know, all of a sudden, instead of making $20,000 a deal, we're making $3,000 a deal, right? That doesn't make any sense. That's not good business. Um, you know, we don't want to bring in bad coaching clients. We're just going to bring everybody else down, right? So mm -hmm. um, to me, it's, you know, it is scaling is looking at your existing business and growing it to be the business that you want it to be, right? And sometimes you got to be careful what you wish for. <laughs> Yeah, you, know, you think you want something and turns out you didn't want that. Yeah, you got to be careful what you get into, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, yeah. You, you don't want to get into everything. Right. And the, the only reason that I've been able to do any of those things, right? Because remember, I'm the stay in the lanes guy. Mm -hmm. I'm the, we are going to wholesale. Mm -hmm. You know, when I brought on partners, I stopped doing rehabbing. 
because I wanted them to come into our business and be focused on the business. And, you know, we're going to do one thing. We're going to do it better than anybody else. We're like McDonald's, right? Again, another recommendation. If you have not watched The Founder with Michael Keaton, watch that. It will really show you how McDonald's literally is run by 16-year-olds because they do one thing and they do it better than anybody else, right? He's like, we do three things. We have burgers, fries, and shakes, right? We don't do fried chicken. We're not doing tacos. We're not doing, we do one thing, burgers, right? Fast burgers with fries and a chocolate milkshake. That's what we do. That's our business. So anyways, so that's the way that, um, that we really built and grew and expanded our, scaled up our wholesale business. And then um, we have some really great people. And I thought, well, you know, a lot of things kind of go into it, but I'm like, you know, I think that we could open this transactions company. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a gap in the marketplace. I think new people certainly struggle with getting deals closed, learn, you know, figuring out that, hey, what's the next step? Mm -hmm. And bigger companies, we can do it for them effectively. They can leverage our team, save money, do it for less like we do with Corey. You know, he saved $80,000 coming to us. So, you know, we can help on both ends of that spectrum. And how can I grow that business? Well, I can't grow by myself because there's only so many hours in the day. Mm -hmm. There are only, you know, so many sticks of flaming dynamite that I can keep up in the air mm -hmm. at a time. But, you know, how does somebody like Elon Musk, like how does he get to be the richest guy, right? Or anybody, right? How does any wealthy person become wealthy other than hitting the lottery, right? Well, most of them find people that can replace them. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in our growth, you know, I have, I have Heather who's amazing. I said, Heather, why don't we start this business easy REI closings, right? I think it would be good. I think we do it really well. I think you do it well. I really think you should do this. <laughs> but, um, you know, I think there's a gap in the marketplace. I think that we can bring people in. We could train them. We had this whole plan. Like, let's let's do this. And it turned out to be a good bet. We, we have a lot of clients now that we're able to take care of. And so cool. Yeah, I'd help yeah. them help, you know, people close. And, you know, our, our our mission statement in ECRI closings is to help investors make more money by doing more deals, right? Because typically here's the thing about entrepreneurs and you know, a lot of them, you're one yourself. Most of them are not good at paperwork, right? Most people left their nine to five job because they're very talky. We're that personality type, right? And, you know, even though most salesmen are really introverts, right? But anyways, they love talking. They love the deal. Mm -hmm. They love talking to sellers. They love mm -hmm. talking to buyers. They love making that deal. Mm -hmm. Well, that personality type, diametrically opposed to the paperwork people, right? 95% of them hate paperwork. You're probably the exception, right? You're an entrepreneur, but, you know, you're an attorney, so you love that kind of stuff. But most, like, you are far and few between. Most of them, they don't like that. They don't want to do it. They don't. They don't enjoy it. They don't like dealing with the title company. They don't like collecting all of the documents. They don't like doing all of those mm -hmm, things. So, mm -hmm. so that's where we come in and we're able to help the new people go from doing one, two, or three deals a month to five. Because now all of a sudden, 25 or 30% of their time isn't dealt calling a title company, waiting on hold, sending an email. Oh, now I got to go collect this document. Oh, shoot. You told me you had everything, but now you need this, right? Because all that time you know, now that they've got that time back, now they can talk to more sellers. Now they can talk to more buyers. Right, of course. And they're able to grow their business. Big companies like like Corey and some other large companies that we we handle that do five, six, seven hundred thousand dollars a month, for those people, now they're able to take that person who was doing transactions and take that money and put it back into their company, into marketing or into other payroll, or shift that person into a place where they should have been and they can outsource that to us. And because, you know, our team, we have a very experienced team. You've met some of them. Oh, yeah. Um, like, this is what they do all day long, every day. Yeah. And we hire people for that have that personality type that loves paperwork. I have a girl in my office, Shelly. She's like, oh, you need me to do a spreadsheet. Like, I'm your girl. Like, I really want to do it. You know, but if I asked her to do Facebook marketing, she'd be like, eh, you yeah. know, I don't want to be putting anything on some Facebook. Some are meant for what they want to do, too. Right. Listen, we're not all the same, right? To go back to, we're not all good at everything. We're not. Like, I'm not good at everything. I understand very clearly the things I'm good at and the things that I'm not. And those things that I'm not, I'm going to outsource to somebody who can do it better. Yeah. Right? Corey, our friend. We keep bringing Corey Geary up. Corey. But Corey's really good at PPC. So I knew when we restarted our company after after we separated with my partner. Um, by the way, you're never going to want to talk to me again because I feel like I'm giving you every story that I've got to give you in this, no, in this, this one is, episode, right? No, this is awesome. So, um, <laughs> so I said, Corey. 
you know, I've got to stop doing PBC or I got to start, stop doing SMS. I need to learn PBC. He's like, great, fly on out. I'll teach you. Right. Well, it happened to be, we were in Phoenix at another event. So we're sitting next to each other and he's such a good go-giver guy, right? We're friends. I've, I've trained his dispo team and he's like, oh, let me train you on PBC. So literally, have you ever set up a P- you've set up a PBC Yeah, it just right? started. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm sitting next to him and he's got his computer up and I've got my computer up and he's like, okay, you do this and you do this, keywords and blah, 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 negative keywords and and dude, I knew eight minutes into that that I was never going to do it. Yeah, like right. I knew, you hire people yeah, to do that. Well, kind of I don't stuff. because my brain doesn't work that way. Yeah. I don't have neither the attention span, none of it. Like, God bless him because he's such a good friend. But he spent like an hour, like, oh, let me help you set it up, and we're going to do this. And there were parts like I engaged with, but like I knew, like I, I was at the end going to say, hey man. Can I just pay you to do this? Yeah, yeah. Right? Who can I pay to do this? Because I can't do this. Oh, and you're going to have to check it every... I come in every Saturday and I check my stuff and I look for the, the, the whatever, the Google thing, right? Like, I don't even know. Like, I'm not doing that. That's not my thing, right? I don't, I don't, I don't want anything to do with that. Yeah. So I outsourced it, right? I went and found somebody who was better at it than I could ever possibly be, who could do a better job and honestly do it cheaper. Same thing with easy, right? Yeah. I went out and found somebody who could train my team in acquisitions who, um, you know, brings to the table what I want, right? Like, I love somebody that can teach with that high energy. Like, I don't have that. I use Eric Klein, right? He's got a oh, great yeah. course. Right, Eric, do you know him? Yeah. Dude, you got to get him. I don't know if you could get him. Like, I don't know if this room could contain him, right? Because he is. Oh, no, he's wild. Oh, my God, he's awesome, right? So I hired Eric to train my team, right? I bought his course. Yeah. I use it to train my team. You know, I have the best dispo course. You want to train your dispo team? Come to me. I'm your guy. But I'm not good at everything. And people have to understand, you don't have to be good at everything, right? That's there are it. plenty of experts out there, probate or video or whatever it is. Yep. Go, go get that person who's the expert and, yep. and let them make you better. Yeah, that, that's huge advice. Huge yeah. advice. S- simple, but really to the point where a lot of people don't focus on that, right? Yeah. I mean, that that happens all the time. Yeah. Um well, we we are right at the end. Okay, and are I, we? All I, right. I I, I want to ask two more things. Well, I do a thing at the end anyway. Okay. So. Oh yeah. Oh, that's right. I saw it. and I was going to be prepared. Yeah. For, and now <laughs> I forgot what it was. So. Was oh, that like you're the gonna, new thing now? Everybody's got to be. You're going to be prepared me. for that. You're going right? to catch me with whatever it was. But I I did watch two recently. I'm like, oh, he's going to ask a thing. Better the be ready thing for that. at the end. No, we'll yeah. we'll we'll get there. Don't worry. You'll you'll have your moment, and, and afterwards you're going to go. Shoot, I should have said that. I know, right? Um. Social media. Let's watch the <laughs> let's watch the meter go off again, yeah. right? Okay. Yeah. Great advice for people out there to just jumping in the game on doing it, right? For content, content creation, mm-hmm. um, any tips and tricks? <sighs> Social media. So there's always a story, right? <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I have a story for everything. People are going to be so tired of my nonsense, right? So years ago, I have this friend. His name is Ryan Russell. Good friend of mine. He is the, um, I don't want to mess this up, but he teaches social media marketing at University of Tennessee. Mm-hmm. He was the first guy that UTC hired, University of Tennessee at Chattanooga, to, um, to teach this. So probably five, six years ago, he's like, dude, because he's a young guy, dude, you're out at all these properties. Why aren't you filming it? I'm like, uh, I have a face for radio. Like, I don't want to be doing that. Yeah. And uh, he's like, no, man, as you're walking through properties, you got to get your camera out and be doing the thing. And I'm like, uh, I don't really want to do that. I yeah. don't need to do that. I don't yeah. want to be famous. Like, yeah. that's not my thing. What am I going to do? Post a video and five people are going to like it. And then what? Right? Like, who cares? Well, turns out he was right. Turns out Gary Vee was right. Right? Social media is... It is currency in the sense that if you want to be out there and be doing business with people, what do we say at the beginning? People do business with people they know, like, and trust, mm-hmm. right? So social media is a thing, right? I think we were, we were talking before backstage about um, how I'm such an incredible late adopter of everything, right? I was like the last person to Apple. I'm, you know, the last person to Novations, right? I'm always the last person to everything. Uh, and maybe that's a, that's obviously a personality flaw, but uh you know, had I been filming everything five, six years ago, how much better or further ahead would I have been? But again, I have crippling anxiety about all of this stuff. So, so doing social media marketing, it, it was just one of those things where I had to decide about a year ago, I think we were talking earlier about, well, I'm not good at this, but I'm going to force myself to get better. And how do you get better? You just get better by doing mm-hmm. it. Mm-hmm. So is it important? Yes. Should you be documenting your journey? Sure. 
even in the earliest days of coaching, I would, uh, you know, people would ask me, well, hey, how did you get all these private lenders? I'm like, oh, well, I at least knew, like, I, I didn't want to be on video, but I was at least smart enough to be posting, hey, here's a picture of my rehab. Hey, here's the rehab we're starting. Here's 20 before pictures. And then as we were going, I would create these albums and I would, you know, I would just post, but I was always posting and telling people what I was doing. So even in the early days, you know, I may not have been to like, whatever videos, but, uh, but I was posting pictures and showing my journey. So if you don't want to be on camera, at least be doing that, at least be documenting what you're doing because people are watching. Right. Absolutely. So what happened for me was people, I was like, Hey, we're, you know, we're doing this property. We're fixing this house. It had tenants, whatever it is, right. All the things that we're doing and people started coming out of the woodwork. Hey, do you need investors? Do you need, do you need money for that next deal? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> That'd be awesome. But they were doing that because there was social proof, I guess, or, you know, you could see that we were the real thing. Yeah, right? credibility. And, yeah, we had yeah. credibility. And because, visibility. Yeah, we're standing in the basement full of water in our boots like, hey, yeah. you know, here's a picture of the sump pump that we're doing over on, you know, whatever road, yeah. right? Or no Sunbeam Terrace. Yeah, yeah, whatever it is. Um, or, hey, you know, we're doing this or, hey, we're doing that. Mm -hmm. or And we're posting pictures of traveling around the world and doing some other stuff. And that's mm -hmm. kind of a whole different thing. Um, you know, people only want the glory, not the not the hard work. Yeah. Right? But... Uh, so yeah, so over time, you know, we just got a little bit of reputation and it's certainly in our city of being legitimate real estate. Like we really do this thing, right? We really buy houses, we really go to closings, we really have tenants, like we really do all the thing, which is crazy because at one time, <laughs> we were, our friend Sheik, our mutual Sheik, yeah, Sheik, Sheik. Who, 210 Sheik, Sheik, who is uh, amazing. So he he films all of our, all of my stuff for sure and some of yours, but um we were, we were posting in front of these apartment buildings that I own. And, you know, he's like, oh, just tell people like what you make off of rent in this, you know, uh, in these, these properties or whatever. And people legitimately would reply like, oh, anybody can just stand in front of any apartment complex and say it's their own. I'm like, dude, it's 1202 Duncan Avenue. Look it up. It's not that it's not, you know, you can't, we're legitimately. You can't we, just do that like a landlord, yeah, right? Like, well, like some people. Yeah. Like, I was like, some people be like, I bet he won't post the address. Well, I'm not talking about like, look it up, man. It's not, you know, it is. We really do this yeah. business. But yeah, so should people document their journey? Yes. If you don't want to be on video, at least post pictures of, hey, here are the things that I'm doing, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You know, hey, I just bought this mobile home park. Hey, I'm doing this. Hey, my team is doing this. Um, like people love, like they love to watch your journey. Oh, they yeah. They really do. Oh, yeah. And, you know, the people that love you will watch it and the people that hate you will be rooting against you, but they're still watching. To go back to private parts, you know, what did the the uh, the thing when when Stern went to NBC? They're like, yeah, the people that love him watch him or listen to him for like forty five minutes a day. Yeah, oh, that's not that great. But the people who hate him listen for three hours, <laughs> right? Your haters will watch you, you know, watch you even more than your the people that love you. Um, but yeah, post what you're doing, document your journey. Yeah, don't be afraid to be on camera. Listen, you know, there are plenty of people that that want to give me grief. Like, listen, they also get on there and tell a supermodel their boobs aren't perfect, right? So every, they're going to, their trolls on the internet are going to goof on everybody for everything. Yeah. Just, you know, get out there and, you know, bring value. You know, when you're posting, is there something about this where I can help somebody else? Because to, to, to go all the way back to the beginning, when we talked about going to CFRI and, and I was that kid who was nervous and I was afraid to go mm -hmm. in. And even when I did finally go in, you know, I still kind of sat by myself and I would see the experienced investors over there like talking and yucking it up and talking about their deals. Like I was afraid to go over mm -hmm. and talk to them. Mm -hmm. Like it was a legitimate fear. You know, I'm not good enough. It's Catholic guilt, man, all of it. Right. But you know, I was afraid to go talk to those people. So I remember, like I distinctly remember that time in my life where I was not the expert. Right. Yeah. I was brand new. I didn't, I didn't, I was afraid to go ask a question because I thought it would be stupid and whatever, right? Yeah. All of those things, of yeah. insecurities that we have. So, you know, when I'm at an event, I love talking to people. I don't go searching people out. I'm not like going, I'm not you. I can't do what you do. <laughs> what you do is really great. I wish I had that, right? I don't have that. That's not an attribute that I've got, but I do love talking to new people. And so that's sort of the way that I think about social media is like, what would be something that I wish somebody would have told me or that I could have seen or I could have watched or, you know, is it helpful? Right. 
Like I'm not doing any dances. There's no skits. I'm not putting on any wigs. Right. We're just going to talk about real estate. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know about everything. I don't, Mm -hmm. frankly, I don't know a lot about most other stuff in life. Right. right? Um, But I do know about real estate. So that's the stuff that we talk about. Yeah. I love it. I mean, again, love that you're posting reels all the time and and dropping tons of nuggets and so lo- loads of information yeah. um i love how the comment feed does get uh uh crazy it gets, and wild it gets sometimes it does but you know what it's actually keeping things engaged yeah right like oh yeah people that want to like comment or be stupid like i'll engage with them and because every comment just kicks it up to the top right of finally after like seven or eight times i'll be like Hey, Al, man, I really appreciate your comments. You're really helping my Instagram algorithm. Right. Like, finally, you have to say, like, this is why I keep going back and forth with you because you're only helping me. And this is why this thing has a million views and 5,000 yeah. comments. Right. right. Yeah. Um, so it's all, all the engagements actually. A all good engagement thing. is good engagement. And then right? responding to people that have commented yeah. and making more videos off of it. And, yeah, uh, and, uh, and yeah. you know, I, I do, you know, like, if you post a question, like, I'll do my best to answer it. Right. I wish that with it, within Instagram, there's a way to do like an instant video, like right mm-hmm. underneath it, like Facebook, you can. But because, um, again, I remember like when we started, there was none of this. Right. There was like 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 Preston Ely, who like we have to go way back for anybody who even remembers who he is. Kenny Rushing, Tim Mai was around back then. Um, Jeff Watson, like. There was like, they would be like a weekly Wednesday webinar, which at the end, you knew they were selling you something, but it was still great information. That was the only place to get this kind of information. There was nobody on YouTube except Ty Taylor, Ty the Flipman Taylor, who, you know, had a great video series. Like I watched all his videos twice in the early days because that was the only education there was. There wasn't a million podcasts where everybody, you know, could start their own podcast or just a Zoom, right? Like off your, off mm-hmm. your laptop. You know, there wasn't Facebook or Instagram. Like none of this existed. Mm-hmm. So where you could find information was, you know, it was harder to find it. That's why it was the kind of the golden age of Rias because that's why you'd have two, three, 400 people show up because this was the only place to get that information. Now, the good news is information is every place. The bad news, information is every place, right? Right. Like everything is the kind of the scales of justice, right? There's a lot of information out there. It's not all good. Right. Right. Some of it's old. Some of it's outdated. Somebody's from somebody who didn't know what they were talking about. So there's that. Yeah, no, social media has been huge. And uh, I love seeing your success when it comes to that, David. Mm. I think it's keep it going. I mean, you know the team's got you when it comes to coming up with content. I'm sure Heather and Hannah got you. uh, Oh, yeah. Got you thinking about stuff. I've got Hannah on a thing right now of of, making content. So so I've got them on doing their own content for because now we need easy content, right? Yeah. We're, We're promoting that and. Yeah, it's a, it becomes social media. It becomes a thing, right? It yeah. becomes its own like yeah. life. It takes on a, a life of its own. Oh yeah, it's a, it's its own. Um, you don't even have to have a TV uh, station. You don't even have to have a mm. TV show. No. You literally have social media now, oh, and you that's can your start, channel. Start a YouTube channel. Yeah, that's your. You channel. want to talk about English bulldogs and like because I love English bulldogs. We could do a podcast on English bulldogs. I have two of them, two fat, stinky English bulldogs. <laughs> And I love them and they, they run my house. But yeah, whatever you're passionate about, like talk about it, right? So like no matter what you're doing, mm-hmm. right? The thing that you love. And again, so again, to, to kind of to, to wrap it up and go back to where we started, lots of ways to do real estate, right? Real estate's like being a doctor. You'd be the eye doctor, the nose doctor, the tongue doctor, the ear doctor, the butt doctor, the knee doctor, the toe doctor, whatever, right? Same thing, lots of ways to do real estate. So you know, again, you could be condo conversions, land development, wholesale, pretty houses, lease options with John Jackson, or, you know, whatever type of real estate you want to do, find something that you love, Mm -hmm. right? You know, don't try to do something that you don't love because it won't last, right? You've got to legitimately love. If you want to be a wholesaler, you probably love talking to people at the end of the day. So again, with social media, it's the same. Like whatever thing you're passionate, if you're passionate about parakeets, man, Tell it. Do parakeets, right? Do parakeets. Because you're going to resonate with resonate with people. Because if you're not, like, people can tell. Like, people can tell with, when you, you really love something, right? There are only so many, you know, videos you could do of you getting out of a Lambo and doing the, the crisscrossy dance across the street, which I love. I watch them all. But, like, how many of those can you do, right? You have to talk about something that, that inspires you. Yeah. And, you know, your goal should be to inspire and help other people. Yeah. Right. Motivate and influence and inspire, educate. Right. Those are important things. Don't be afraid of like, oh, my God, I can't tell this one thing that, you know, like is really great in my business. 
I don't know. What do you want to know, man? We'll tell you. Yeah. Right. You want to know what lists we're calling? We're calling vacant. We're calling absentees. Yeah. You know, high motivation lists. Yeah. It's not complicated. There's nothing. You know, there's no hocus pocus to this business. It's relative. It's a relatively simple business. It's people that kind of complicate it. Yeah. Love it. David, awesome stuff. I mean, jam-packed episode, if you couldn't tell, with lots of info, lots of content. Yeah. And, I mean, this is what we wanted to do, right? Yeah. Sit down, hear the story, hear the background, yeah. something. I Normally, we're doing this, and it's like 10 o'clock at night at, you know, at some house party where we were at, right. passing the mic back right. and forth, yeah. right? Where we weren't even drinking. Like, I nope. watched those reels, and I'm like, was I drinking? No, I was not drinking. I said some crazy stuff. But nope, nope. Anyway. I mean, we were we were out that night. It was crazy. We I mean, did. Uh, I was, uh, so, do you ever, have you ever met Nick Perry? Have you met yeah, him? Uh, yes. Okay. Yes. So, again, another story, right? So, um, Nick and Corey and I and Corey's sister, Crystal, we were at Chris Rude's mobile home event in Lafayette, uh, Louisiana. So a couple days before the event, uh, Corey called me. He's like, hey, we want to drive up to uh, New Orleans. We've never been there. Um, do you want to go? Like, yeah, let me, uh, I could change my flights around. I really need to be back by Monday night though. So so I was going to fly back Sunday. I'm like, mm, okay, let, let me change my flights. I booked a real early flight, like, you know, 6 a.m. on Monday. So I'm like, okay, man, like we'll go to New Orleans. I'll show you around because I've been there. The three of them hadn't. Well, anyways, so we're running around New Orleans all day shooting content, and it was great. Like, really good, really good stuff, early days, like, yeah. before any of us really knew what we were doing. And, uh, like, as the day went on and we started drinking more and more and more, we finally realized there was a point where we need to stop recording because we're going to say something really dumb. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, anyways, great. What a great, great trip that was going to New Orleans. Yeah. Oh, I bet. I bet that was a lot of fun. Fun. Tons of fun. God bless there. Corey again for being sober and putting up with our three <laughs> drunk asses on a Sunday night in New Orleans as we're stumbling around till love three in the morning love it you know? david so much info so much stuff i'm so happy hopefully there was one or two good things in there no, one of like 10 12 wow. 20 things in there Thank you. um i'm so happy we were able to do it in person yes not virtual not everybody gets to come in and i know you actually get and now we have on the shelf we have the easy rei closings uh, what do we call it? Tumblr. Mug? Tumblr. Tumblr? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So this is now officially on the shelf. So, and we brought you something else, but it's, oh, maybe we can. Well, so here's a, this is, yes. Let me see this so I can present it to you. So I get to travel around a lot. And so two things that I do love, even though we, we thought we were only going to go to Chattanooga for a couple of years and then we we're going to move. Um, I love Chattanooga and I do love whiskey. So lo and behold, Ooh. I don't know which, which camera you want to be on. I don't even there know. There's Chattanooga whiskey. Chattanooga so whiskey. So that's a bottle that I bought a while back. They don't even make it anymore. But wow. I love to give uh, gifts of, of Chattanooga whiskey um, to people as I travel around, as a, you know, as an appreciation for having me on and you know, inviting me over to the studio to do this. So so cool. Yeah. I mean, I've never seen this before. Like yeah. like this either bottle or... No, it's it's pretty... Again, another story. You, you guys were talking about going to, to Gatlinburg earlier. Tennessee, believe it or not, even though it's Jack Daniels, is, is uh, um, distilled there. Other than that one county, which is also a dry county, by the way. Mm. So the, where Jack Daniels is made, you can't consume alcohol. That's sure. interesting. It's Did very not weird. not know that one. But... Um, there, there was a law, again, I'm going to do this the best I can here. There was a law in Tennessee where it was, well, as it was illegal to distill alcohol within the state other than that one mm -hmm. carved out thing. Mm -hmm. So these guys who started Chattanooga Whiskey, they actually got together with the moonshine guys up in Gatlinburg and some other uh, people who wanted to start distilling whiskey, and they got the laws changed. They lobbied the state legislature. And, of course, Jack Daniels probably was lobbying against them because they didn't want anybody else. But Chattanooga Whiskey was actually a brand back in the 1800s, and they figured out it wasn't trademarked, I guess, and that they were able to, to buy it and trademark it and get the, the URL. And uh, they figured out a way to be able to bring distilleries back to Tennessee. So cool. now, now you have the moonshine up in Gatlinburg and – Chattanooga whiskey and it was because of these guys that they huh. they went out and and figured out how to how to fix the laws crazy so, wow yeah. there we go a, yeah. a so, fun fact about whiskey yeah. so and... their slogan is whiskey to the people nice nice oh, no yeah. thank you for this I mean that's that's really really cool I mean yeah. we we love the stuff on the shelf so yeah. I know oh. I was watching you last week on something I'm like I better bring some good stuff and you know 
Oh, make sure, yeah. Make sure that I can contribute to the shelf. Oh, right? yeah. The shelf's growing. Um, yeah. Yeah. Hopefully, it's not going to need a third shelf at some point. Yeah, you might. You might um, have to come up with something a little different to, to add all the stuff in here. Yeah, we have to may have to get longer shelves, actually. I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. But no, yeah. it's an awesome addition to the wow. shelf. And of course, all my guests, I also have a yes, gift the, for you as well. Yes. Oh. And this is the Al Nicoletti t shirt okay. presentation for okay. any person that comes in. In person to my show. Nice. Yep. We got awesome. the shirt. Look at that right there, everybody. Look at this. Awesome. Al Nicoletti Esquire. There you which, go. Which, by the way, apparently just means attorney, right? There you go. Yeah. yeah. How many I'm years of law school? And that was the best answer that you have for me. <laughs> we'll be Googling that later. So, um, cool. Yeah. So well, there you go. Kind of you. I'm going to take a couple of these back for the girls in the office. Oh, no. Yeah, absolutely. We have we have shirts for Heather and Hannah. And, so And my wife, Heather. She said Heather, she wanted one as perfect. well. Perfect. We got that. Yep. We'll bring that back. And um, David, fun stuff. I'm, I'm just so glad that. What we is were... What was our final question? You didn't ask me. Oh, no. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're waiting yeah, for Yeah, no, it. I'm ready. I, I forget what it is. I <laughs> feel like I should have been the prepared. table. He's like ready yeah. to go. Like, All right. Let me drink. What a, is this? A, okay. I'm drinking my whiskey here. Vodka. Yeah. <laughs> hopefully water um water. so as i do with all my guests that yes. we, when we conclude the al nicoletti show we always want to hear those final words of wisdom yeah. and any thoughts that really can resonate to the audience out there um and really it's final words final thoughts on anything david olds easy rei closing mm. scaling growth partnerships um anything that you really wanted to hammer home yeah that could be that could play a huge part in someone's business or the role. So, as I say, final words, final thoughts. Let it rip, David. Okay. Olds. Well, interestingly enough, I don't you know I don't know that anybody who has wisdom ever thinks they have wisdom. But um, this is what I'll tell you, and this is for for anybody who's just starting out or you know you're beginning your real estate journey. This is a difficult thing. It is not as easy as a lot of people want to portray it, right? We've talked a lot about the stumbling blocks and things that happen and the hurdles that you have to overcome. And there are a lot of days where you're going to get up in the batter's box and you're just going to get a pitch to the head, right? It's just going to happen. Hopefully you've got your helmet on, but they're just, you're just going to get beat up a lot, right? Not because real estate's this terrible thing, but the, just any, anything that you're starting new, you don't know everything, right? Like if I was to get underneath the car and try to change the oil, there's going to be the one thing I forget to do, right? Well, that happens in this business. So, so it's a challenge. It's a challenge to start anything and grow it. And here's what I tell people. Like find a tribe of your people, right? Find people that you can go on this journey with, mm -hmm. right? So go join your local real estate group right? Or meet up, or if there isn't one, start one. Everybody can go to meetup, I think it's .com and start a group in their, mm -hmm. in their area. You know, you can go to Panera and sit around, have coffee, and that's maybe where it starts. But have people that, that you, can, you can talk to and that you can share the wins and, you know, talk to on the bad days because they're going to be bad days, right? It's not all going to be easy. If it was all right. easy, everybody would do this. So, you know, find people whether they're in your city or, you know, you find some people on the other side of the country, right? Now we have Facebook and Snapadoodle and Instachat and all the things, right? Um, so there are people that you can find that are on a similar journey if you're nervous about being, you know, talking to people in your town. But, um, you know, collaboration is a great thing. You know, there you can find somebody that, you know, again, you share those wins with, I don't want to keep repeating myself, but here's the thing. There are going to be days where you're up and somebody else is down and, and you can help that person, you know, get through that bad day. And then there's going to be when you've got a bad day and, and somebody else can help you through. And, and I'm really lucky that I've got a great group of friends from all over the country. Sometimes I feel like I see you guys more than I see my own family who lives in my town because we're always traveling. But, um, you know, we talk about partnerships to sort of put a bow on it. Like when, when I had to decide to, to get out of my last partnership, like that was a big decision. And I was able to call, you know, the Ricardos, the Nicks, the Corys, you, Charles, Michael. Like I had those people that, you know, I was friends with that I could call and say, hey, here's what I'm thinking. What do you think? Mm -hmm. Or, hey, here's a problem that I'm having today. What do you think? Mm -hmm. And, you know, they were there to help me get through a really tough time. Mm -hmm. Conversely, I've talked to almost all of those same people who've had a tough day who've called me and I'm like, Hey, listen, I get it, man. It's that sucks. Here's how we can get through this. Right. So 
find, you know, that would be my advice to people is find a tribe of people that, that you like, that you resonate with, that where, you know, you can count on them on days you're having, you're having a bad day and that you can help them out when they're having a bad day. And you can sort of be on this journey together and grow. Yeah. No, yeah. love it. I think that's valuable info, right? Yeah. Find those right people to surround yourself with yeah. in your industry. And uh, I'm honored and privileged to call you a friend. Yes, man, uh, for sure. Mentor, you. everything that Not you can. That, but. Yeah, well, no, I mean, you learn from, sure. from what people are going through yeah. and you learn from people that are scaling their businesses. Mm -hmm. And so there's things that you can really pick up. And then yeah. it just... It's a tribe, right? We're yeah. all part of a great community. Mm -hmm. And and like I said, I'm thankful that you were able to come. Thankful oh, that we've been able to, to like really connect this year yeah. I mean, of, of the year to do it, being mm -hmm. at all the events, uh, doing what we've been doing, mm -hmm. speaking where we have and what, mm -hmm. what we've been doing. And uh, yeah. it's great. I, I can't wait to see Easy RA Closings keep growing. Yeah, I can't wait you. to see Heather just keep pumping it out over there oh. and just and just you know, really keep training everybody. Mm -hmm. And then Hannah's mm -hmm. growing and then the yeah. whole team's going and you need to come up and, and meet the rest of our team. Oh, I absolutely. I'll, tell you, I'll now be there. Is actually like the, this is the best time of year to be in Chattanooga. The weather's just perfect. It's not too hot. You know, a little change of seasons, all that type of stuff. So yeah, you need to definitely come up. I'll do a whole weekend, you know, <sighs> great. be so nice. Right. Yeah, yeah. We'll do some stuff. We'll shoot some content and then I can show you our city. It's really, it's a, it's a beautiful city. Yeah. And now uh, what I learned is uh, Pepsi's also there. Well, Pepsi has a distribution center, but Coke is the big one. Okay. Like Coke is, Coke's, that's our people. Yeah, because right? all of a sudden you just dropped uh, Pepsi during the episode. Well, I did. There's that other one. Like every city has a distribution center for, yeah. for both, right? Yeah. Um, but yeah, like my son, he's a manager at uh, Little Debbie's, huh. which is actually the McKee Corporation, the McKee family. But, you know, he, you know, supervises people that make the honey buns and do all the things. He runs a bunch of different, I don't even know what all he does. It's a lot of stuff. But uh, yeah, man, I mean, a lot of cool stuff in Chattanooga. It's a great, it's a great city. Can't wait to come visit you. Can't wait to see the whole team and everybody yeah. there. So David, thank you again, man. Thank Once you, again, no, thank you. you. Love it. Love seeing you. Thanks for having me. I'm I glad really we were appreciate getting... all of you guys putting up with my nonsense for a little bit. No, no. And you know what? We got it. We're going to do this, uh, especially for Dave Day. So this officially broke the record for longest oh. episode Has it been that long? yeah it, 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 it's um let's see where are we at uh probably three hours no no yeah, yeah probably probably about three hours so is it really uh, yeah three yeah three hours too oh my we crushed him right yeah two so to dave day we absolutely oh. crushed this whole thing <laughs> i didn't think it had been three hours i felt like two hours maybe yeah no it's been three yeah been crazy right yeah that's People have told me that. Like Heather, she's like, oh, you're getting on a podcast. She'll be on there forever. My wife and my wife is named Heather and my vice president of operations is also named Heather. It doesn't make for anything confusing in life, right? I've never yeah. told the wrong one of them I love you except once. And it was very embarrassing. But uh, um, yeah, I've done a bunch of like... I'll get on like name and I was on his podcast with RJ Bates the other day, his group. And like it went two and a half hours. I did one Tony Montebolano and three and a half hours. Wow. So, so this is kind of a thing for me as I talk too much. Uh, hey, that's it's good. We got all the info we needed. So, yes. uh, David again, pleasure. And, um, uh, everybody's going to get so much info from, awesome. from this whole episode. Cool. So thank you for having me. You got it, man. Well, it's a wrap on the Al Nicoletti show with special guest, David Olds. And, uh, we talked everything from partnerships, growth, scaling, you name it. When it comes to the title world, messy title situations, and it's also super important that we dive in on the guest's backstory and how their journey all began. Because a lot of people will face similar same situations when it comes to really getting into real estate or diving into any business, really. Uh, what are the struggles? What are the successes, the, the downs, the failures, and how to overcome those situations? So if you missed any of this episode, there's so much to unpack when it comes to different concepts in the title world, in the dispo world, and wholesaling, exit strategies. I love that we talked about that too, is exit strategies when it comes to creative financing and the things that you can do. There's so much out there. So you want to go back to the beginning and watch the episode, or you could even unpack this a little bit at a time in different concepts. If you're focusing on one thing, you just find that one thing in the episode and unpack it and, and just so much to go from there. So 
I love it. I know so many of you that are going to be watching this episode, see this episode. Uh, so I just want to say, because this is the Thanksgiving uh, episode, I want to say I am thankful to all the fans and the followers out there that watch the Alan Nicoletti show. I'm so thankful that we get to do this. It's a privilege that we get to have uh, the ability to go live, to have have people that are watching. Uh, I'm thankful that you all are there and, and, and participating and that we all get to do this together. It means so much. And that we get to bring in amazing guests like the great David Old. So uh, if you want more content like this episode, make sure you check out the Al Nicoletti YouTube channel, the Facebook page, the personal page, and of course the Instagram that's dropping micro content on the show from season one, season two, season three, and things on probate, quiet titles, partitions, all those things at Attorney Nicoletti, which is on Instagram. And of course, you can find all the amazing episodes of all the guests that have been on the Al Nicoletti Show, which is on season one, season two, season three, on iTunes, Spotify, and Google Play. We don't want to forget Google Play for those that are out there that watch Google Play. So it's a wrap on the show tonight. Have a great Thanksgiving, everybody. And we will see you next week on the Al Nicoletti Show. Have a great night. We'll see you soon.